Track 16. The trading was profitable with Bongola, who brought out many fine ivory tusks from his hoard to sell. Then Van Houten came in from one of his forays into the wilderness and proudly showed Tom five porcupine quills, each stoppered at one end. When he removed the stopper from one and poured the contents into the bowl of his gold scale, Tom stared at the tiny pile of metallic flakes and granules, which gleamed yellow in the sunlight. "'Gold dust?' he asked. "'I have heard tell of the fool's gold. Are you certain this is not it?' Van Houten bridled at the slur on his professional integrity, and showed Tom how to test the flakes with acid from his box of chemicals. "'The acid will eat... Any of the base metals, but not the noble one, he explained. They watched it bubble and fizz as he dipped the flake into it, but when he brought it out the metal was bright and unscarred. He took Tom to the place where he had panned the dust and showed him the string of gravel beds and sandbars along the course of the stream down one of the valleys. At Tom's request, Bongola sent them fifty women of the tribe. Traditionally, the men would not engage in such menial labour, as working in the field or digging holes in the stream bed. Van Houten gave each of the women a pan and showed her how to use it, dip and swing, swirling the gravel in the pan and letting the dross flow away over the lip until only the gleaming tail remained. Swiftly the women learned the art, and Tom promised them a measure of glass beads for each quill of the noble dust that they brought to him. Van Houten's alluvial goldfield proved so rich that a hard-working woman could fill a quill in less than a day, and soon gold panning was the preferred activity of the tribe. When some of the men wanted to join in such a profitable pastime, the women drove them away indignantly. The rains threatened, and it was time to head down river again. The longboats were low in the water under their cargoes of ivory, and Tom had almost a hundred ounces of gold dust locked in the ship's strongbox. When Abeli told Fala and Zeti that he was leaving them with their families until he returned next season, they burst into distraught wails and fountains of tears. Sarah remonstrated with him at such treatment. How can you be so cruel, Abeli? You have made them love you, and now you are breaking their little hearts. They would die of terror and seasickness on their voyage down to Good Hope, and even if they survived they would pine for their mothers every day they were away. They would make my life as miserable as their own. No, they must stay here and wait for me, as good wives should. The desolation of the two girls was miraculously relieved by the parting gifts of beads, cloth, and hand mirrors that Abeli bestowed on them, enough to make them the richest wives in the village. Both girls were bubbling over with giggles and smiles as they waved farewell to his tall figure at the tiller of the leading longboat. When they returned to Lotsi land at the beginning of the following dry season, both Fala and Zeti were huge with child, their glossy black bellies bulging out over their loincloths and their breasts big as ripe melons. They gave birth within days of each other. Sarah acted as midwife and delivered two baby boys. "'By God!' said Tom as he examined the infants. "'There is no doubt they are yours, Abeli. The poor little devils only lack a tattoo to be as ugly as their father.' Abeli was a changed man. Gone was his dignified reserve and regal bearing when he held a chubby, drooling son on each knee. The scarified visage that had struck terror into a thousand enemies became benign and close to beautiful. This one is Zama, he told Tom and Sarah, for he will be a mighty warrior. And this one is Tula, for he will be a poet and a wise man. That night, in the darkness of their hut, Sarah laid her cheek on Tom's and whispered into his ear. "'I want a son also. Please, Tom, please, my darling, give me a baby to hold and love.' "'I'll try,' he promised. "'With all my heart I will try.' But as the years passed, part of each spent at Fort Providence or travelling in the wilderness of Lotsyland, the other part spent in the Cape of Good Hope. Sarah remained slim and tall and flat-bellied, with nothing to swell her womb or puff out her shapely bosom. Both Zama and Tula grew swiftly into strong little boys, taking after their father, 
tall for their age and natural leaders of the other boys of their age group. They spent their days in the forest and on the grassy plains along the river, tending the communal cattle herds of the tribe and learning to handle bow and spear, coming to know the ways of the wild creatures of the forests. In the evenings they sat at Abeli's feet at the fireside and listened wide-eyed to his stories of the sea, of battles and adventures in faraway places. Take us with you, father, Zama pleaded, as Abeli had predicted. He was the taller and stronger of the brothers. Please, honoured father, Tula piped, take us and show us these wonders. You must stay with your mothers and tend your duties here until you have been circumcised and initiated into manhood, Abeli promised them. Then Lord Klebe and I will take you with us into the world beyond Lotsiland. The elephant hunting was good in Lotsiland, and Van Houten discovered a new alluvial goldfield three days' march to the north of the original one, which brought in a steady trickle of gold dust to Fort Providence. Both the tribe and Tom prospered and each season of the big rains the Centaurus took a full cargo down to the Cape. An Amsterdam bank of good repute had an office on the Hirngracht above the waterfront. Tom already had £2,000 deposited with them, and after the season the amount was doubled. At last he was a wealthy man. He had to face one bitter disappointment. When the time came to sail north again, Ned Tyler declared himself too old to undertake another voyage. By now his hair was as fine and white as new-picked cotton. His back was bowed and his once clear eyes were clouded and roomy. Leave me on my little farm here in Constantia Valley, he begged. Let me tend my chickens and vegetables. I'm going to stay with Ned, Dr. Reynolds decided. I've had enough adventure to last my lifetime. Only when he looked carefully at the surgeon's red, bluff face did Tom realise how he had aged along with Ned. I have had all I want of bandaging and stitching up your rascals. I want to plant a few vines, perhaps make a good wine before I die. But who will look after us? Tom protested. You cannot send us out to die of malaria in the wilderness. You have a fine little surgeon with you, the old doctor replied. I have taught Mistress Sarah all I know about setting a broken leg or mixing a potion. I place you in her good hands, and like as not you will be better off. Lord knows she is prettier than I am, and has a kinder heart. Alf Wilson took over as first officer of the Centaurus, and he had the helm as they pushed into the mouth of the Lunga River at the beginning of the next hunting season. Every man and woman aboard was consumed with excitement on these annual returns to Fort Providence. They were all eager to see how Fundy had taken care of the settlement during the rains, to learn if the elephant was still plentiful upon the hills of Lotsey Land, and to find out how much gold dust the women had collected in their absence. Abeli tried unsuccessfully to conceal his eagerness to be reunited with his wives and children again. By this time, Fala and Zeti had added generously to their brood. There were two small daughters and another two sons. As always, Fundy met them on the landing below the fort and welcomed Tom and Sarah ashore. All was well in the fort, and there was little rain damage to be repaired. Sarah unwrapped the canvas cover from her harpsichord, played a chord, and then smiled when the notes were true. She launched into the chorus of Spanish ladies. Aboli demanded from Fundy the news of the tribe and his family. But there was none, for the rains had been heavy that season and the river not navigable. No canoe from Bongola's village had reached the fort. Abeli fretted through the time that it took to unload the cargo from the Centaurus, to repair the fort and to make the final preparations for the expedition upstream to Lotsiland. He was at the tiller of the leading longboat when they were ready at last to leave Fort Providence. The first intimation of something seriously amiss came when they reached the outlying villages of the Lotsi and found them all deserted. Though they searched the area around each cluster of huts, they found no living soul, nor any clue as to what had happened to the inhabitants. Dreading what they'd find there, they went on towards Bongola's village as fast as they could row, dragging the boats through the shallows and keeping going as long as there was light enough to make out the banks on either side and steer around the rocks in the channel. 
They came to it in the early afternoon. A dreadful hush hung over the hills. No sound of drum or horn or shouted welcome. They saw at once that the outlying gardens were overrun with weed. Then they passed the first hut on the bank. The roof thatch had been burned, and the walls stood gaunt and bare, the mud plaster washed away by the rains. Nobody in the boat spoke. But as he pulled with all his strength on the long oar, Arbeli's face was a terrible mask of despair. They stared at the ruins of the village as they passed, the burned huts, neglected gardens and empty cattle pens. The top branches of the trees were lined with rows of roosting vultures, grim silhouettes, hunchbacked and hook-billed. The sickly, sweet stench of death and putrefaction was on the air. A single canoe lay on the beach of the landing, but its bottom had been staved in. The fish racks on which the men dried the catch had fallen down, and the nets were abandoned in untidy heaps. Abeli jumped overside when the water was waist-deep, waded ashore, and ran up the beach to the overgrown path that led to the huts of Fala and Zetti. Tom followed him, but did not catch up with Abeli until he came to the small cluster of huts surrounded by a boma of thorn branches. Abeli stood in the open gateway, staring at the burned-out huts of his wives and children. Tom stopped beside him, but neither man spoke. Then Abeli walked forward and knelt. From the soft blue ash he picked up a tiny human skull, and held it cupped in both hands, as though it were a sacred chalice. The cranium had been crushed by a heavy blow. He stared into the empty eye sockets, and the tears washed down his scarred face. Yet his voice was steady as he looked up at Tom and said, The slavers always kill the babies, for they are too young to survive their march to the coast. Their weight only weakens their mothers, who are forced to carry them. He touched the deep dent in the dome of the tiny skull. See how they held my little daughter by the ankles and dashed her head on the doorpost of the hut. This was my beautiful baby, Kassa, he said, lifted the skull to his mouth and kissed the ghastly wound. Tom could not watch his sorrow. He looked away and saw that somebody had written on the wall of the roofless hut with a stick of charcoal in Arabic script, God is great, there is no God but God. That made certain the identity of the perpetrators of this atrocity. He stared at the legend while he tried to compose himself. When at last he spoke, his voice was stifled with horror. When did this happen? he asked. Perhaps a month ago, Abeli stood up. Maybe a little longer than that. The slave columns must move slowly, Tom asked, with the chains and the women and children. Yes, Abeli agreed. They move very slowly, and it is a long, weary road to the coast. We can catch them, Tom's voice grew surer and stronger, if we start at once and march hard. Yes, said Abeli, we will catch them, but first I must bury my dead. Make the preparations for the march, Clebby, and I will be ready to leave before noon. Abeli found two more tiny skeletons among the ruins and weeds. The bones were scattered and chewed by the carrion-eaters, but he identified his babies by the bead bracelets he had given them, which were still entwined with the small bones. They were of his two youngest sons, not yet two years old. He gathered up their remains and placed them in a tanned leather cloak. He dug their grave in the floor of the hut in which they had been conceived and buried them together. Then he opened a vein in his own wrist, dribbled his blood onto the grave, and prayed to his ancestors to receive the souls of his children kindly. When he came down to the landing, he found that Tom had almost completed the order of march. From years of experience in hunting the elephant herds, each man knew his duty. There were three bands of five men each. They were commanded by Tom, Alf Wilson, and Luke Jarvis. Three sailors would be left to guard the boats. Each man of the expedition carried his weapons, powder and shot, his water skin and blanket, and enough food for a week. That was a full load of sixty pounds in weight, and once it was expended they would live off the land. 
You must stay here with the boats, Tom told Sarah, as he unwrapped the blue sword from the canvas roll in which he kept it. He did not carry the long weapon on the elephant hunts, for it hampered his gait, but he would need it now. There will be fighting and danger, he explained, as he belted the scabbard around his waist. That is why I must go with you. There will be many wounded and hurt, and none to minister to them. I cannot stay here, she replied, and he saw the determination in her set expression, the cold light in her eyes. She had already packed her medicine chest and blanket. He knew from long experience it would serve no purpose to argue with her. He gave in. Keep close to me. If we run into danger, do as I tell you, woman, and for once do not stop to argue. Led by Abeli and Fundi, they went in single file through the remains of the village. They passed many more skeletons along the path, all that remained of the old men and women and small children judged too weak by the slavers to survive the march to the coast. It was a relief to leave behind the scene of death and desolation and to follow the trail left by the shuffling lines of Lotzi prisoners as they were driven northwards into the hills. Abeli and Fundi set a killing pace. Fundi carried his great elephant bow over one shoulder and a quiver of poisoned arrows over the other. He too had lost his family in the slaughter and the pillage. By Tom's reckoning they covered ten miles in that first march, and he declared a halt only after the moonless night became too dark to allow them to make out the ground under their feet. He slept only fitfully with Sarah beside him under their blankets. Soon after midnight he sprang to his feet as a ghostly cry echoed from the summit of the hill above them. It was a human voice calling down to them in the language of the Lotzi. What manner of men are you? I am Clebby, your friend, Tom shouted back. I am Abuli, husband of Fala and Zeti. Abuli threw more wood on the fire, which flared up brightly. I am Fundi, the hunter of elephants. Come down to us, men of the Lotzi. They appeared among the dark trees, moving shadows in the firelight that materialized into human shapes. There were less than a hundred survivors of the raid, many of them women, but over fifty warriors who still carried their weapons, throwing spears, and the heavy elephant bows with quivers of poisoned arrows. They squatted in a dense mass around the fire, and one at a time the elders described the attack that had caught the village by surprise, the massacre and the slave-taking that had followed. Some of us were able to run into the forest, and others were out hunting or gathering roots and wild honey, so we escaped, they explained. What of my family? Abeli asked. They have taken Fala and Zeti, and your sons Zama and Tula, they told him. We saw them in chains when we spied upon the slaver's caravan from afar. They sat all the rest of that night, reciting the long roll of those who had perished and those who had been captured. In the dawn, when it was time to resume the pursuit, Tom ordered the old men and the women back to the ruined village to bury the dead and plant crops to ward off the famine that must inevitably follow this disaster. Some of my men are there. They will hunt game to feed you until the crops are ripe. They went back obediently and Tom assembled the remaining Lotzi warriors. He knew most of them by name, and had hunted with some. We're going after the caravan. We will fight to free those who have been captured, he told them. Will you join us? We wanted to follow them, but the Arabs have fire sticks, and we were afraid, they said. But you also have the terrible fire sticks, so we will come with you. Fundi picked out the most intrepid, skilful hunters among them and sent them to scout ahead to discover any ambush or snare the slavers might have set. When they started out again, he kept the rest of the Lotzi with them, following the well-worn slave road into the north. They marched hard from first light of day until dark, and though the signs of the slave caravan were too old and eroded for even Fundi and Abeli to read accurately, they knew that they had covered in a day the same ground that had taken the long files of chained slaves six days to make good. During the day they had passed the rudely thatched shelters and dead campfires of that number of overnight camps. The next day they were away again at first light, and before noon they came upon the remains of the first casualties among the slaves. 
There were only a few bone chips and blood-caked scraps of loincloth lying beside the path, for the Arabs had removed the chains from the corpses and the forest scavengers had devoured the rest. These were the weak ones, Fundi said. They died of weariness and broken hearts. We will find many more before we catch up with the caravan. On each day's march now, the sign became fresher and clearer to read. Always the road was marked by the old camps where the caravan had passed the nights, and by the remains of those who had not survived the rigours of the journey. Ten days out, and they came upon the junction of the roads, where the slave column from Lotsi land in the south joined up with another more numerous column coming in from the country of the great freshwater lakes in the west. Fundi and Abeli examined the abandoned site where the two caravans had camped the first night after they had met. There are now over two thousand slaves in the column. I have counted their sleeping places, Abeli showed Tom where the slaves had flattened the grass when they lay down for the night. Most are carrying heavy loads, some made up of food supplies, grain and dried game meat. How do you know that? Tom demanded. Their deep heel prints in the dust show that they are burdened. Then they have discarded a few of the empty food baskets beside the cooking fires and left a few kernels of grain and scraps of meat in them, Abeli explained. But they are also being forced by the Arabs to carry many ivory tusks as well. Ivory? Tom's interest was piqued. Where would they find ivory? The Arabs have plundered it from the villages they have raided, and the Omani are also hunters, as you are. Fundi had joined in the discussion. How can you tell this about the ivory? Abeli took him to the far side of the campsite and pointed to marks in the earth. This is where they stacked the tusks while they rested for the night. The long curved imprints in the earth were clear for even Tom to read. There are about a hundred and sixty Arab guards and merchants with the caravan, Abeli led him to the thatched bombers of thorn branches that had housed the guards for the night and pointed out the mattresses of cut grass on which they had slept. One for each man, and I have also counted the footprints. How can you tell the footprints of Arab from those of slave? Tom wanted to know. The Arabs wear sandals. Many have big dogs on leashes. Here you can see the pad marks. They use them to frighten the slaves, and to catch the runaways. We have wasted almost an hour here, Tom cut in. We know how many enemy there are to deal with. Let us go after them. This huge agglomeration of heavily burdened men and women moved even slower than before, and the much smaller file of pursuers, hardened by years of hunting the elephant herds, gained on them rapidly. In the middle of the morning of the seventeenth day since leaving Bongola's village, two of the scouts came running back to the head of the pursuit column, where Sarah marched beside Tom, matching him stride for stride on her long legs. "'We have seen the smoke from their campfires ahead,' they shouted, before they reached the head of the column. "'Stay with Luke and Alf,' Tom ordered Sarah, and he beckoned to Abele. The two moved forward falling into the steady trot they used to close in on the elephant herds in the final stage of the hunt. The Lotsi scouts guided them to the top of a small granite hill from which they had a good view over miles of the country ahead. The smoke from hundreds of small cooking fires was scribbled against the cloudless blue of the sky, not more than a few miles ahead. We have them now, Tom exulted, and led the others down the hill at the same ground-eating trot. Within the hour, they reached the deserted encampment, and the fires were still smoking. The wide pathway, beaten by thousands of bare feet, wound away among the trees, and they ran along it. They stopped involuntarily to a distant sound, a mournful dirge sung by a thousand voices, soft in the harsh midday sun, but heartbreakingly beautiful. The slaves were singing a lament to a lost land, to the home and loved ones they would never see again. Tom surveyed the land ahead. "'We will circle out to the right,' he pointed. "'We must get ahead of the column and watch as it passes, "'so that we know the exact numbers and the formation they are keeping.' "'They came out of the edge of the trees, "'and before them lay an open plain that reached to the horizon, 
the pale yellow grassland shimmering with mirage in the sunlight. Isolated copies lay like small islands on the wide expanse, and here and there stood a flat-topped acacia tree. Herds of game were scattered across the open plain, zebra, wildebeest and gazelle. Giraffe stretched up their stately necks to feed on the top leaves of the acacia, and here and there a rhinoceros stood, massive, horned and dark, against the pale grass. Two or three miles out on their left flank, a fine mist of dust marked the position of the slave caravan, and Tom and Aberley agreed quickly on their next move. One of the conical granite hills stood fairly in the path of the distant column. Its summit would afford an ideal vantage point, but they had to move swiftly. They left the Lotsey scouts hidden in the trees, and the two broke into a full run across the plain. They were almost blown by the time they reached the foot of the little hill on the opposite side from the approaching caravan, and they threw themselves on the ground and struggled for breath. As soon as they had recovered sufficiently to sit up, they drank a few mouthfuls from the water skin. Then they pulled themselves to their feet and climbed the rocky side of the hill. Just below the summit they threw themselves flat once more and peeped cautiously over the top. The head of the slave caravan was a mile distant across the grassland, and would pass close to the foot of their hill. Thousands of tiny figures were strung out in a straggling file, reaching back almost three miles to the edge of the forest. It was exactly as Tom had pictured it from Aberley's reading of the sign. At the head of the column rode an impressive figure on an Arab stallion. He was dressed in long green robes, and his head and face were covered in a flowing turban of the same colour. Only his eyes were left uncovered. Two stark-naked black female slaves trotted beside the horse, holding a large tasseled sunshade over the rider. The other Arabs were marching on the flanks of the column. Through the telescope, Tom counted 154 of them, all told. 136 were foot soldiers, and the others were mounted. They were all robed and heavily armed. The mounted men rode back and forth along the column, urging it on. The slaves were too numerous to count accurately, but Tom saw that Aberley's initial estimate of 2,000 must be close to the mark. Most, both men and women, were naked. A few wore scraps of leather or ragged trade cloth around their waists. They were all fettered. The children were tied together in groups of five or six, with ropes of plaited bark or rawhide around their necks. The slavers had not used up on them their supply of chains. The heads and bodies of all the slaves were coated grey with dust, through which sweat had streaked, giving them an unearthly appearance. They were all carrying something. Even the children had gourds or grain baskets balanced on their heads. The women held the bedrolls and possessions of the slave masters, or baskets and water skins. The men brought the ivory. Through the lens of his telescope, Tom saw they had hundreds of tusks between them. A few were so large that it took four men to carry one. Closer and closer the column crept to the foot of the hill on which they lay, and they could make out more details and hear the mournful singing. One of the women near the head of the line dropped the basket from her head and slumped to the ground, pulling down the three others who were chained to her. Those around her tried to lift her to her feet again, but she was too weak to stay upright. The disturbance brought four of the slave masters running. They gathered around the fallen girl, and Tom could hear their angry shouts as they tried to get her up again. Then one of them laid into her with a kiboko. He swung from on high, aiming first at the back of her legs, and when that had no effect, raining cutting blows across her back and buttocks, the sharp clap of the lash on bare skin carried clearly in the heated air. At last the guards resigned themselves to the loss of another piece of trade goods. One knelt and unlocked the shackles from the girl's wrist. Then he seized her ankles and dragged her body off the path. His comrades urged the halted column forward, and they left the girl's naked, dusty body where it lay. Now the column was passing so close to the copy that they could make out the faces of the slaves with the naked eye. Suddenly Aberley stiffened and grasped Tom's arm. He pointed to the centre of the line, and it took Tom a moment to see what had excited him. There another file of children marched, boys and girls mixed indiscriminately, linked together with a long light rope around their waists. 
Each child carried a bundle or basket balanced on his or her head. The size and weight of each load graduated to the age and strength of the one who carried it. The boy at the head of the file was the tallest. He walked proudly and lithely where the others slumped with weariness and despair. Zama, said Abele, my eldest son, and that is Tula behind him. His voice was level, but his eyes held a great burning anger. There is Zeti and Fala also in the rank behind them. The two women were naked, chained at the necks, their breasts heavy and full of the unsucked milk left by their massacred infants. Tom had nothing to say for his old friend's comfort, so they lay quietly and watched the sorry procession wind past them. So slow was the pace that it took almost two hours, but the slave masters drove them on with shouts and flicking whips. In the wake of the column, a pack of hyena and jackals followed. They gobbled up the excrement left on the felt by the dysentery-racked slaves and any other discarded waste and offal. Tom thought that the abandoned slave girl must have died, but he was wrong. When the hyena gathered around her in a circle, giggling and hooting with greedy excitement, she struggled up on one elbow and tried to rise to her feet, but the effort was too much. She collapsed and drew up her knees to her chest, covering her dusty head with bare arms. The hyena pack drew back a little, but then edged forward again, circling her. One stretched out its neck and tried to sniff her foot. The girl picked up a stone, threw it, and the beast backed away. Then another of the huge dog-like animals rushed at her from behind and sank its fangs into her shoulder. While she rolled and kicked in the dust, it worried her, shaking its massive head, until it had bitten out a lump of her flesh, which had swallowed, while the girl collapsed sobbing on the dusty earth. The smell of fresh blood was too much for the others to resist. Another hyena darted in and seized her foot. It ran off with her, dragging her like a sledge on her back. Tom jumped to his feet, ready to rush down the hillside to save her, but Abele pulled him down again. The Arabs are still too close. He pointed at the tail of the column half a mile away. They will see you. There is nothing we can do for her. Abele was right, of course. Tom slumped down again and watched another hyena rush in and bite into the girl's stomach, leaning back against the drag of the first animal. They had her stretched out between them, and her wild screams carried to the men on the hilltop. Then a dozen other beasts joined in, ripping her apart, crunching her bones with their great jaws, wolfing down her flesh while her struggles weakened, then ended. Within minutes there was nothing left of her, but the wet and bloody patch of earth. The pack loped on after the disappearing slave caravan. Tom and Abele climbed down from their vantage point and followed after them, shadowing the caravan while the day dwindled away and the sun crept down towards the horizon. When the slave masters ordered the night halt and the column went into bivouac, they crept even closer. Using the cover of a grove of acacia trees, they assessed the layout of the camp, carefully noting the horse lines and the boomers of the Arabs. When the sun set and darkness fell, they left the camp and hurried back. Within the hour they met up with the rest of their party coming up behind them. They built a screened fire to cook the evening meal, and while they ate hurriedly, Tom held his war council and gave each of his lieutenants their orders for the night attack on the Arab camp. As soon as they had finished eating, they moved forward again. They could see the glow of the campfires from two miles away across the plain, and moved in. Tom and Abeli placed each of the Lotzi archers in his allotted position, and repeated their orders so there could be no misunderstanding. Then they moved into their own positions and began the long wait. Tom wanted to attack in that darkest time between midnight and dawn, where the spirits and vigour of the Arabs would be at their lowest ebb. Slowly the campfires of the caravan flickered lower, then burned down to puddles of red ash. The great scorpion of stars, tail held high, crept down across the sky above them, then sank towards the horizon. The voices and the singing of the slaves died away, and a profound silence settled over the encampment. It's time, 
Tom said at last and stood up. They moved in closer and made one last inspection of the encampment, making certain that nothing had altered. The only fire still burning brightly was the one at the horse lines among a grove of acacia trees on the near side of the camp. Against the flames they saw three of the Arab guards sitting together, drinking coffee and talking quietly. They were staring into the fire. That will blind them, Tom thought grimly, and then whispered to Abeli, Take the one nearest you. They moved in until they were at the edge of the circle of firelight. Both had kept their swords covered, so there would be no reflection of firelight to alert a sentry. Have at them! Tom slipped his blade from the scabbard and ran lightly up behind the seated Arabs. He killed the first cleanly with a thrust in the back of the neck. Across the fire, Aberley killed another. The dead man fell face forward into the fire and his turban and long bushy hair burst into flames and flared like a torch. The third Arab let out a startled shout and started to his feet. But Tom stabbed him in the throat. The blue sword slid in sweetly and the next shout drowned gurgling in the man's own blood. Tom and Aberley crouched over their victims' bodies, listening for the alarm, but the horse lines were set apart from the main camp, and the dying Arab had made no more noise than a sleeping man in a nightmare. All was still. They moved to where the horses were tethered. Another dark shadow came to meet them from among the trees. Tom challenged with a low, two-toned whistle, the call of a nightjar. The recognition signal came at once, and Luke Jarvis stepped forward. All secure, he murmured, letting Tom know that the other Arabs in the horse lines had been taken care of. Tom ran to one of the horses. He had picked out the bay stallion the Arab leader had ridden that day, and marked its position in the lines. Now he untied its halter and spoke to it softly, stroking its forehead, gentling it with hand and voice. Then he swung up onto its bare back. Aberley had chosen another horse, and when he was mounted, Tom whistled softly to Luke. Luke ran back to where his men had surrounded one of the sleeping boomers of the Arab guards. Almost immediately there came thudding volleys of musket fire all round the periphery of the camp, and spurts of muzzle flame pricked the darkness as the sailors fired into the sleeping Arabs at close range. A low buzz ran through the camp as it came awake, and quickly built up into a screaming, shouting uproar. The Arab slave-masters came stumbling out of the Burmas, half asleep and fumbling with their weapons, to be met by volley after volley of musket fire and flights of whistling lotsy arrows. The slaves were unable to move, for they had been chained down to the iron stakes that the slave-masters had driven into the hard earth. They lay where they were fettered and wailed and howled with terror, adding to the confusion. Some of the Arabs were firing back, and a determined resistance was mounting. Tom galloped down the line towards the Burma of thorn branches, where, at sundown, he had watched the caravan leader take shelter. He carried a burning brand from the guard's campfire in one hand, and now he hurled it onto the thatched roof of the hut. It caught quickly, and the flames soared up, showering sparks and lighting the night for a hundred yards around. Driven out by the heat, the Arab leader came running from the hut with a jezel in one hand. He was without a turban, and his oiled grey hair fell to his shoulders. His beard was in tangled disarray. Tom wheeled the horse and charged straight at him. The Arab stood to meet him and threw up the jezel. Tom lay along the stallion's neck and drove it on straight into the muzzle of the musket. The Arab fired, and in the bloom of powder smoke Tom heard the ball whir close past his head. He expected the old man to turn and run, once his weapon was fired. Instead he stood proudly, helpless and unarmed, but with head up and fierce eye to meet his death. Tom felt a pang of admiration and respect as he leaned out and drove the glittering blue blade through the man's heart with such force that the Arab was lifted clean off his feet and died before he struck the ground again. Tom rode back and looked down at him. Moved by the night breeze, his silver beard feathered across his chest. Tom might have felt remorse, but then he remembered Aberley's massacred children, the girl who had been eaten alive by the hyena pack and his guilt withered stillborn. He wheeled away, 
and from the back of the stallion looked down the line. At two places the slave masters had taken cover and grouped together in small pockets of resistance. Tom called urgently to Aberley. We must break them up. Ride with me. They stormed down upon them, swords bared, and yelling with the furious ecstasy of battle, they cut them down. The Arabs who survived broke up under this onslaught. They threw down their empty muskets and ran out into the darkness. Let them go! Tom stopped his men from pursuing them and consoled himself. They will not get far, and I will send Fundy and his archers after them as soon as it is light. In the fighting he had become separated from Aberley. He rode down the slave line searching for him. The fighting was over, but the encampment was a shambles. Many of the slaves had pulled up their stakes and were stumbling about in the firelight, shouting and howling. The din was deafening, and Tom could not make his orders heard. When he tried to beat sense into some of the slaves with his scabbard, it only made them more witless with terror. He gave up any effort to quieten them and rode on looking for Aberley. He saw his horse, but with no rider. He felt a painful stab of concern that Aberley had been shot off its back. He urged his own horse forward, but then in the crowd he saw Aberley on foot, carrying two small boys in his arms, hugging their naked, dusty bodies against his chest. They are unharmed, Clebby, both of them, Aberley shouted to him, and Tom waved and wheeled back to find Sarah. He knew she would be somewhere in the sea of black bodies, trying to minister to those who needed her help, and he felt real concern for her in this dangerous, volatile atmosphere. She could easily be trampled by the surging mob, or run into an escaping Arab who carried a curved dagger on his belt. He saw her golden hair like a beacon in the firelight, and pushed the stallion through the throng to reach her. He bent down, slipped an arm around her waist, lifted her up onto the horse's withers in front of him, and kissed her. She threw both arms around his neck and hugged him so hard that it hurt. You did it, my darling. They're free. And there's a fine load of Arab ivory to pick up, he grinned. You base creature, she smiled back at him. Is that all you can think of in this glorious moment? My father taught me, do good to all men, but at the end remember to collect your fee. It took the rest of the night to restore order among the hordes of slaves. Most were still in chains, but as soon as it was light they began the work of freeing them. Tom found an enormous bunch of keys on the belt around the waist of the old Arab headman who he had killed. The keys fitted the locks, and as they were released, Tom ordered the slaves to be placed in separate groups, divided by tribes and villages. Then he made them the responsibility of their own chieftains and headmen. Sarah tended first to Aberley's family. The two boys were unhurt and still healthy. Zeti and Fala were beside themselves with terror, but Aberley spoke to them sternly, and they quietened. When Sarah was certain they no longer needed her help, she went among the others. First she picked out the children who needed medical attention. Many were smitten with dysentery, and she dosed them with a binding potion, then treated their chain and rope galls with healing ointment. Though she worked tirelessly through the night and into the following day, she could not do enough with her small medicine chest for the hundreds who called to her for help. While this was going on, Tom sent Fundy and his band of archers after the fleeing Arabs who had escaped during the night. They had not gone far, and most were unarmed. Fundy's men hunted them down quickly and finished them off with the wickedly barbed arrows. The poison turned the flesh around the entry wounds purple, then ran through the blood like liquid fire. It was not a kind death, but when the hunters brought back the severed heads of their victims as proof of the kill, Tom looked upon them dispassionately. The deeds of the dead men were fresh in his mind, and his anger was not yet appeased. Under their officers, the sailors ransacked the camp and piled the spoils in a heap for Tom to count and enter in his logbook. Apart from the mountain of ivory, they found a small iron chest in the ashes of the caravan master's hut. It had withstood the heat of the flames, and when they broke it open, they found it contained gold dinar coins worth almost three hundred pounds. That adds up to a fair profit for a day's work of good deeds, Tom said to Sarah with satisfaction. 
They gathered up the food baskets and the muskets, the kegs of powder and the bars of lead for casting shot, bales of trade cloth, sacks of beads, and mounds of other valuable equipment. How are you going to carry all this back to Fort Providence? Sarah wanted to know. You may be forced to leave it here. We will see to that, Tom promised grimly, and had Fundy and Aberley bring all the headmen of the released slaves to him. He explained to them that he would divide up the food stores between the people from the different tribes, and that the women and children were free to return to their villages. However, in exchange for their freedom, every one of the men must act as porter to carry the spoils down to Lotzeland. After that, they would be free to follow the women back to their homes. He explained to them that they would be paid in trade goods for their labour. The chieftains were delighted with this arrangement, for naturally all the wages of their subjects would come directly to them. Until that moment, they had not realised that they were free again, and had believed that they had merely exchanged one set of slave masters for another. It took several days to share out the food and make up the splinter caravans before Tom was able to send the women on their way home. They went singing their thanks and praises to the white men who had saved them. Then the heavily burdened caravan of men started into the south, with Tom and Sarah mounted on captured Arab horses at their head of the column. Tom left Fundy and twenty of his most intrepid hunters to patrol the slave road during the rest of the dry season. As soon as they spotted the approach of another Arab caravan, Fundy had his orders to send runners to Fort Providence to alert Tom. When they reached Fort Providence, Tom realised that he had more than a full cargo of ivory for the little Centaurus. We will not be forced to hunt again, for this season at least, he told Sarah. I'll be able to concentrate all my efforts on freeing more of these miserable slaves from the clutches of the wicked Mussulman. His expression was pious and virtuous, but she saw the twinkle in his eyes and was not taken in. I wish those were honest sentiments, Thomas Courtney, but I know you too well. You were in this for the ivory and the fun of a good fight. You are too harsh a judge, my pretty darling, he protested with a grin, but why should you quibble? It's those brats you care about, and I'm giving them into your care. This way we both have our heart's desire. It won't be as easy as next time, she warned him. The Arab merchants will be expecting you. Ah, but I also have a few ideas on that score. They had captured almost two hundred Arab muskets and a goodly store of powder and lead. Instead of elephant hunting, Tom and his crew trained fifty Lotsi warriors as musketeers. They had picked the most promising men, but even these had difficulty in mastering a weapon so alien to their culture. They never truly overcame their fear and awe of the firearm, or the instinct to close their eyes tightly in anticipation of the discharge. Tom soon realised that they would never be marksmen. He accepted this, and instead drilled them to fire massed volleys at close range, loading the jezels with a handful of specially cast buckshot that would spread rather than a single ball. Within weeks, one of Fundy's runners had come into Fort Providence from the north with news of another slave caravan coming down from the lake country. "'Time to see if my new strategy works,' Tom said to Sarah. "'I don't suppose I can prevail upon you to remain here at Fort Providence, out of harm's way?' For answer, she smiled and went to pack her medical stores. When at last they came up with the caravan, they found that it was even larger and richer than the first, but more heavily escorted with Arab infantry and mounted men. Tom's men were outnumbered by almost two to one. He and Aberly shadowed the Arabs for days while they worked out a plan to attack them. Very soon it became clear that the Arab slave masters had learned of the fate of the first caravan. They were very much on the alert. On the march they threw out a screen of scouts, and at the first sign of trouble pulled back into defensive formations in business-like style. They went into carefully constructed defensive boomers when they halted at night, and kept a vigilant cordon of sentries around their encampments to guard against a night attack. Tom and Abberley scouted ahead of the column, and found the ford of a wide river where the slave caravan would be forced to cross. They moved their own force up, and concentrated all their men in the dense riverine forest on the far bank. When the slave caravan reached the river, the long, unwieldy column began the crossing. 
Tom allowed the head of it to cross unmolested. Then, when half of the slaves and their escorts were across, he cut them off and fell on the head of the column. From their carefully concealed positions, the Lotzi musketeers fired massed volleys at point-blank range into the Arab guards. Using the spread of small shot, even they could not miss, and the effect was murderous. For a while the fighting was fierce, but the Arab advance guard was outnumbered and shot to pieces by those first volleys. When their comrades on the far bank tried to cross the river to reinforce them, they were forced to wade almost chest-deep through the current and were driven back in confusion by the accurate fire of Tom's sailors. By nightfall, the fighting on this bank was over. Tom's men had captured the head of the caravan and wiped out all the Arab guards. They had also captured the entire Arab stores of black powder. Tom now had the advantage of numbers, and the remaining Arabs on the far bank were desperately short of ammunition. Tom moved his men across the river and launched a series of lightning raids on the Arab positions, forcing the slave masters to defend themselves and use up the last of their powder. Once their muskets were empty, he attacked in earnest and shattered the Arab line. With the last of their powder gone, the defenders were wiped out in desperate hand-to-hand -hand fighting in which the Lotzi used their short stabbing spears to savage effect. The last of the Arabs was driven into the river, where, drawn by the scent of blood in the water, the crocodiles had gathered. In the aftermath of the fighting, Tom freed over 3,000 slaves and marched south to Fort Providence with a long file of porters carrying vast booty. Although Fundy's scouts maintained the watch on the slave roads, that was the last caravan to try to win through to the Fever Coast during that dry season. We must pray for better business next time, Tom said to Sarah, as they stood together on the quarter-deck of the little Centaurus, as she ran down river to the ocean at the beginning of the big wet. If business grows any better, you will sink the ship under us, she told him. I cannot even use my cabin because it's stuffed so full of elephant tusks. It's all these children of yours that weigh us down, Tom said accusingly. Sarah had not been able to resist taking into her care four of the most appealing orphans from the released slave caravans. She lavished her maternal instincts upon them, and now they clustered around her, dressed in the clothes she had sewn for them, sucking their thumbs and clinging to her skirts. Thomas Courtney, I do declare you are jealous of a few little babies. When we reach Good Hope, I will buy you a pretty bonnet to win back your love, he promised. She opened her mouth to tell him she'd prefer a baby son. But that was a painful subject for both of them. Instead, she smiled. And a pretty dress to go with it. I have lived in rags these past months. She hugged his arm. Oh, Tom, it will be good to reach civilization again, even for so short a time. The Caliph of Oman, Abd Muhammad al-Malik, was dying in his musket palace, and not even the wisest of his physicians could fathom the cause of the mysterious disease that had assailed him. They had purged him until blood dribbled out of his anus. They had lanced the veins in his arms and bled him until his gaunt face was ecru and sallow with plum-coloured eye sockets. They had blistered his chest and back with hot irons to burn out the sickness, all to no avail. The disease had begun to manifest itself shortly after Prince Zain al-Din had returned from the long pilgrimage to Mecca and the holy places of Islam that his father had ordered him to undertake as a penance for his treachery. On his return to Muscat, Zain al-Din had once again made the most abject petitions to his father. He tore his fine raiment and slashed his cheeks and chest with a sharp knife. He poured ash and dust on his head and crawled on his hands and knees into his father's presence, wailing for forgiveness. Al-Malik had stepped down from the ivory throne, lifted him to his feet, and with the hem of his own robe had wiped away the blood and dirt from his son's fat face. Then he kissed him on the lips. You are my son, and although once I had lost you, now you are restored to me he said. Go and bathe yourself, change your apparel, put on the blue robes of a royal Omani, and take your seat on the cushion at my right hand. 
Soon after this, the terrible headaches began, which left the caliph confused and drowsy. Then he was attacked by fits of convulsions and vomiting. His stomach ached and his stools were black and tarry, his urine dark red with blood. While the physicians treated him and looked for improvement, the disease worsened. His fingernails turned blue, his hair and beard fell out in tufts, he drifted in and out of coma, and his flesh melted away so that his bald and hairless head resembled that of a cadaver. Knowing that the end was near, thirty of his sons gathered around his bed in the dark, shuttered, airless bedchamber. The eldest, Zain al-Din, sat closest to his bed and led the chanted prayers for the intervention of Allah in their father's suffering. Once, in the pause between prayers, Zain al-Din lifted his tear-filled eyes and looked sorrowfully across the bedchamber at his half-brother. Ibn al-Malik Abu Bakr was the son of one of the lesser concubines. He had always been Zain al-Din's trusted companion from their childhood days in the Zenana on Lamu Island. Because of his lowly status in the royal household, Abu Bakr might have dropped into obscurity. However, there is a saying in the desert that every man needs a camel to carry him over the sands. Zayn al-Din was Abu Bakr's camel. On the back of his elder half-brother, Abu Bakr was determined to ride one day to power. He knew also that Zayn al-Din needed him, for Abu Bakr was the faithful servant, shrewd and resourceful, committed to his brother. He had been at Zayn al-Din's side at the Battle of Muscat, and had tried to protect him when the Ottoman Turks had been routed, but in the melee he had been lanced in the chest and thrown from his horse. After the battle he had recovered from his wound and received a pardon from the new caliph. Al-Malik was always benevolent and generous to his sons. Instead of being grateful for this mercy, though, Abu Bakr was fiercely resentful. Like Zayn al-Din, he was ambitious and devious, a born conspirator and greedy for power. He knew that despite his father's expression of forgiveness, his treachery would be remembered for the rest of the caliph's life. May that be short, he thought, as he looked across the crowded bedchamber, fogged with incense smoke, and caught the eye of Zayn al-Din. His brother gave him a barely perceptible nod, and Abu Bakr lowered his eyes, then smoothed his moustache as a sign that he understood. It was Abu Bakr who had provided the bitter white powder that was doing the business for them. One of the physicians tending the sinking caliph was Abu Bakr's man. Administered in tiny doses, the poison accumulated in the body of the victim, so that the symptoms became gradually more acute. Silently, Abu Bakr agreed with his brother that it was time to give the caliph the lethal dose that would end it. Abu Bakr covered his face with the black headcloth, as if to hide his sorrow, and smiled. By this time tomorrow, his elder brother, Zayn al-Din, would be seated on the elephant throne. He, Ibn al-Malik Abu Bakr, would be commander of the armies and fleets of Oman. Zayn al-Din had promised him that, and the rank of imam and two lakhs of rupees from the royal treasury. Abu Bakr had always seen himself as a mighty warrior and he knew that at last his star was rising and beginning to burn brightly. All thanks to my sainted brother Zayn al-Din, may Allah shower ten thousand blessings upon his head, he whispered. At dusk the physicians gave the caliph a potion to help him sleep and to strengthen him against the assaults of the night demons. Although al-Malik coughed, dribbled the medicine down his chin and rolled his head away, the doctors held him gently and spooned every last drop down his throat. He lay so still and pale on the cushions that twice during the long, hot night the doctors opened his eyelids, held a lamp in front of his face, and watched for the shrinking of the pupils. In the love and kindness of Allah, the caliph yet lives, they intoned each time. Then, as the first coppery rays of dawn light pricked through the fretwork of the shutters of the east window, the caliph started up suddenly and gave a strong, clear cry. God is great! Then he fell back on the sweat-soaked cushions of his bed 
and a slow trickle of blood ran from his nostrils and down his cheeks into the bed linen. The doctors rushed forward, forming a circle around the body, and though all his sons craned for a glimpse of their father, he was hidden from them. The chief surgeon whispered to the vizier of the court in lugubrious tones. Then the vizier faced the rows of seated princes and intoned, in a voice of heavy portent, Abid Muhammad al-Malik, Caliph of Oman, is dead. Allah receive his spirit. In God's name, they replied in solemn chorus, many faces rattled with grief. In accordance with his father's wishes, Zain al-Din is the successor to the elephant throne of Oman. May Allah bless him and grant him a long, glorious reign. In God's name, they repeated. But none showed any joy at the announcement. They knew that dark days were ahead. Outside the city walls, jutting out into the sea, was a rocky headland. The cliffs on the point fell sheer into deep water, so clear that every detail of the coral below was etched like a marble mosaic. The new caliph had ordered a pavilion of polished pink granite blocks built upon the lip of the precipice. He named it the Palace of Retribution. From his seat in the shaded colonnade he could look down to the surface of the sea and watch the long dark shadows of the sharks gliding over the reef far below. There had been no sharks when first the palace was built, but now there were many, and they were well fed. Zain al-Din was eating a ripe pomegranate when they brought another of his father's officers barefoot before him. They had shaved his head and beard and placed a chain around his neck as a symbol of condemnation. You were unkind to me, bin Nabula, the caliph said. When I was in disgrace and out of my father's favour, may Allah bless his sainted soul. He spat one of the pomegranate pips, which hit the proud old man in the face. He did not even blink, but stared back coldly at his tormentor. Bin Nabula had commanded the former caliph's army and fleet. He was a soldier proud. You called me the fat puppy, Zain al-Din wagged his head sorrowfully. That was very cruel of you. It was a name that fitted you well, the condemned man replied, and since then you have grown wider in girth and more repulsive in mien. I give thanks to Allah that your noble father cannot know what a plague he has visited upon his people. Old man, you are always garrulous. But I have a certain cure for that vice. Zain al-Din nodded to the new general of his army. My little friends down there are hungry. Do not keep them waiting. Abu Bakr bowed. He was dressed in burnished half-armour with a spiked helmet and embroidered silk-neck flap. When he straightened, he was smiling. The smile on that narrow face with the snaggled teeth of the barracuda was dreadful to look upon. But Bin Nabula did not flinch. Many good men have gone along this road ahead of me, Bin Nabula said. I prefer their company to yours. The executions had been conducted daily over the last months since the accession of the new caliph. Hundreds of once powerful and important men had gone over the cliff to the waiting shark pack. Zain al-Din had a long memory for a slight or an insult, and neither he nor General Abu Bakr tired of the sport. "'Remove the chain,' Abu Bakr ordered his men. He didn't want Bin Nabila to sink too swiftly. They lifted the heavy links from his neck and led him to the block. "'Both feet,' Abu Bakr commanded, and they placed his legs across the block. Abu Bakr had refined the punishment. With his feet gone, the condemned man could splash on the surface but not swim to the shore, and the blood in the water would rouse the shark pack and drive it into a feeding frenzy. He drew his sword and slashed the blade through the air above Bin Nabula's legs, smiling at him with those uneven teeth. The old general looked back at him steadily, without any sign of fear. Abu Bakr could have delegated this duty to any of his men, but he took pleasure in doing his brother's work himself. He laid the edge of the curved blade against the old man's ankle, judging his stroke with narrowed eyes. "'A single clean stroke,' Zayn al-Din encouraged him, "'or I shall claim a penalty from you, my brother.' Abu Bakr lifted the blade, paused at the top, 
then swung down. The steel hissed in the air, then sliced through the flesh and bone and thudded into the wooden block. The white foot, with its blue veins, dropped onto the polished granite floor, and Zayn al-Din clapped his hands. A fair stroke indeed, but can you do the same again? Abu Bakr wiped the blade on a square of silk that a slave handed him, then lined up on the other ankle. Hiss and clunk. The steel sank deep into the wood of the block. Zayn al-Din hooted with laughter. The soldiers carried bin Nabila to the edge of the cliff, leaving a wet red trail across the pink-polished granite flags. Zayn al-Din jumped up from his cushions and limped to the low parapet that protected him from the drop. He leaned over the wall and looked down. My little fishes are waiting for you, Bin Nabula. Go with God. The soldiers threw him over the edge, and his robes ballooned around him as he fell. But he made no sound. Some of them screamed all the way down, and Zayn al-Din enjoyed that. Bin Nabula struck the surface and was driven deep by the impetus of his fall. Then the disturbed water cleared, and they saw him float up to the surface. He floundered there, trying to keep his head above the water, but the water clouded red around him. There, Zayn al-Din pointed down with a trembling finger and shrieked with excitement. Look at my lovely fish! The dark shapes moved with agitation, speeding up as they rose towards the surface, circling the struggling old man. Yes, my little ones, come! Come! Then the first shot in, and Bin Nabula was plucked below the surface. But the water was so clear that Zayn al-Din could follow every detail of the banquet he had set. When the sport was ended, and there was nothing further to watch, he returned to the pile of cushions under the silk canopy and called for cold sherbet to drink. Then he beckoned his brother to come to him. That was well done, Abu Bakr, but it is more satisfying when they scream. I believe the old shaitan remained silent merely to diminish my enjoyment. Bin Nabila was always an obstinate old goat, Abu Bakr agreed. There were six hundred and twelve names on the list you gave me. It is sad, Majesty, but Bin Nabila was number six hundred. We are almost at the end of the list. Oh, no, no, my dearest brother. We are not nearly at the end. One of the chiefs of all our enemies has not been dealt with yet. Give me the rascal's name. Abu Bakr showed his uneven teeth in a grimace that was too savage to be a smile. Tell me where to find him and I will seek him out for you. But my brother, you know him well. You also have a reckoning with him. Zayn al-Din leaned forward, his belly sagging into his lap, and drew up the hem of his robe. Tenderly he massaged the deformed joint of his ankle. Even after all the years, my foot still aches when there is thunder in the air. Understanding dawned in Abu Bakr's dark eyes, and Zayn al-Din went on softly. I did not enjoy being dragged on a rope's end to the gates of Muscat. Al Sali, Abu Bakr nodded. The red-headed, green-eyed devil. I know where to find him. Our sainted father, Allah bless his memory, sent him to Africa to reopen the trade routes for our caravans. Take as many ships and men as you need, Abu Bakr. Go to Africa. Find him and bring him back to me. Broken, if you wish, but not dead. Do you understand me? Broken, but not dead. I understand you perfectly, Majesty. Yasmini waded out from the shore. She sucked in her already flat belly at the cold and raised her hands above her head. Dorian lay on the crisp white sand and watched her. Although they had made love only minutes before, he never tired of looking at that cream and ivory body. She had bloomed since leaving the stultifying bounds of the Zenana walls. Now she bubbled with interest and excitement for all the wonders around her, and when they were alone her sense of fun and mischief enchanted him. Waist deep in the lake, Yasmini scooped a double handful of the sweet water and raised it to her lips. As she swallowed, a few droplets spilled from between her fingers and dribbled onto her chest. They caught the sunlight and sparkled like a diamond necklace on her smooth skin. 
Her nipples puckered at the chill and stood out crisply. She turned and waved at him. Then, with a shudder of protest at the cold water, she lowered herself until only her head showed. Her hair, shot through with the silver blaze, floated in a dark cloud around her lotus face. "'Have courage, master. Come in,' she invited. But he waved a lazy hand in refusal. This respite was so delightful after the months of hard marching up from the coast. "'Is the great sheikh, the mighty warrior and victor of Muscat, afraid of a little cold water?' she mocked. He smiled at her and shook his head. "'I do not fear the water, but you have exhausted all my strength, O brazen one. "'That was my purpose.' She tinkled with laughter, and suddenly rose up and splashed a sheet of the cold water over him. "'Wicked woman!' he sprang up. "'You have exhausted my forbearance also.' He charged into the lake in a storm of spray, and though she tried to escape, he seized her and plunged both of them below the surface. They came up clinging together and spluttering with laughter. After a while her expression became solemn. "'I hear that you have not been truthful with me, Lord,' she said. "'I am holding in my right hand that which proves your strength is far from exhausted. "'Is it enough that I ask your forgiveness for deceiving you? "'No, it is not nearly enough.' "'She placed both slim arms around his neck. "'This is how the fish and crocodiles punish their mates when they err. "'She hopped up, and beneath the surface gripped his hips in the scissors of her legs. A while later they waded back to the beach, still clinging together and laughing breathlessly. They flopped down at the edge of the water, and Dorian looked up at the height of the sun. He murmured regretfully, Ah, the morning is almost spent. You must go back now, Yassi. Just a little longer, she pleaded. Sometimes I grow weary of playing the slave boy. Come, he ordered, and pulled her to her feet. They went to where their clothing lay in an untidy heap, and dressed quickly. The little sailing dhow was drawn up on the sand, but before she stepped on board, Yasmini paused and looked about her slowly, taking leave of this wondrous place, where for an hour they had been happy and free. On the top of the tallest tree of the island perched a pair of snowy-headed fish eagles, their sleek bodies black-washed with cinnamon. One of the birds threw back its head and uttered a yelping chant. I will never forget that cry, Yasmini said. It is the very voice of this wild land. Their hills on the far side of the lake were just an outline, paler blue than the water. A long line of pink flamingo flew low along the far shore. The head of the flight rose on a thermal of warm air, then dropped again. Every following bird rose as it reached the same point in the air and then dropped exactly as the bird before it had. The effect was extraordinary, as though a long pink serpent undulated above the Asia waters. Nor will I ever forget such beauty, Yasmini whispered. I would like to stay here forever with you. This is the country of God, where man counts for nothing, Dorian said. But come, we cannot afford such a dream. Duty has me in its iron grasp. Tomorrow we must leave this place and begin the march back to the fever coast. Just a moment longer, Lord, she begged, and pointed to a strange dark cloud, a mile out from where they stood, that rose from the surface of the lake, five hundred feet straight into the unsullied blue of the African sky. What is that? It is as though the water is on fire and sends smoke into the air. Tiny insects, Dorian told her. They breed on the bottom of the lake in their multitudes, then rise to the surface and spin tiny sails of gossamer. On these sails they float into the air and are carried away. The ways of Allah are wonderful, she murmured, eyes shining. Come, he urged again, and remember that you are once more Yassi the slave boy, and that you must show me duty and respect. Yes, master. She bowed low, with her palms together, touching her lips, and her entire demeanour changed. She was a consummate actress, and when she straightened up she held herself like a servant, not a princess, and moved like a boy as she pushed the dhow out into the lake and scrambled in over the bows. 
They sat apart as the tiny craft rounded the end of the island and came in full view of the village on the mainland, a league away across the water. Even at that distance, many eyes would be watching them. Although these waters were so expansive as to seem like the ocean itself, they were months of travel from the fever coast, and the climate was drier and healthier up here on the high plateau of the continent. The village of Gandu was spread along several miles of the lakeshore, for this was the centre of all Omani trade with the interior. From here, the long slave road wound down to the coast. In sight now were a dozen or more canoes and sailing dhows plying in towards the port of Gandu. They had voyaged down hundreds of miles of lakeshore, and they carried cargoes of dried fish, ivory, slaves, hides, and gum arabic they had gathered from the vast wilderness. As Dorian and Yasmini sailed in towards the village, she wrinkled her nose with distaste. The sweet air was tainted with the stench of the fish racks and the slave barracoons. When Dorian stepped ashore, Bashir al-Sind, his chief lieutenant, was there to meet him with the rest of the army staff. Yassi hung back, self-effacingly, while Dorian was plunged immediately into the duty and responsibility of his command, a duty he had escaped for those few precious moments on the island with Yasmini. "'The women have arrived, Lord,' Bashir told him, "'and the merchants have gathered to listen to your orders for the march.' Dorian strode through the village, between the seething barracoons where the slaves were pent, through the squalor and misery that was in such bitter contrast to the beauty and serenity he and Yasmini had experienced a short while before. In the main souk, seated on their cushioned stools under their gaudy silk sunshades, each surrounded by his own entourage of robed guards and house slaves, the five merchants awaited him. These men controlled all trade coming through Gandu. They were all pious learned men, their speech was cultured, and the compliments they paid him were florid. Their deportment was dignified and noble, and they were exceedingly rich. Yet Dorian had come to despise them in the short time he had been at Gandu, and exposed to the savagery of the trade that supported them. Dorian had been a slave once, but Al-Malik had never treated him as one. Slavery had been a constant fact of his adult life, but for this reason he had given it little thought. Most of the slaves he had ever known were tamed or born into captivity, resigned to it, and in almost every case treated kindly as valuable chattels. But since arriving here at Gundu, he had been confronted by the raw, brutal reality. He had been forced to witness the bringing in of the freshly captured people, and it had not been a comfortable lesson. He found himself torn by his own humanity and his love and duty to his adoptive father, the Caliph. He understood how the prosperity and well-being of the nation depended on this trade. He would not shirk the duty of protecting it, but he took no pleasure in what he had to do. It was the hour of the midday prayers, so they made their ablutions. Yassi poured water for Dorian to wash, and he prayed with the merchants as they knelt in a row on the silk rugs, facing the holy places in the north. When they resumed their seats under the sunshades, Dorian felt a strong desire to forego the elaborate opening speeches of the merchants, the further exchange of compliments, and to come to the business that had to be discussed. However, he was now so Arabic in his ways that he could not bring himself to such gaucherie. The sun was well past its zenith before one of the merchants mentioned, almost in passing, that they had two hundred female slaves ready for him as he had requested. "'Bring them to me,' he ordered and when the merchants gave the orders, the women were paraded before him. Dorian saw at once that they had fobbed him off with the oldest and most sickly. Many would never survive the gruelling march to the coast. He felt his anger stir. He had come here to save these men from ruin. He had a firman from the caliph commanding their obedience, and now they were niggardly and obstructive. He controlled his anger. The condition of the women was not vital to the success of his plans. He intended to place them in the caravan merely to lull the marauders into attacking. A slave column composed entirely of men must excite suspicion. Out of hand, Dorian rejected fifty of the women, the weak old crones and the women far gone in pregnancy. The rigours of the march would kill the old and bring those pregnant into labour long before their time, and Dorian could not take on his conscience the inevitable deaths of their infants. And for the same reason he had refused the offer of children the merchants made. "'When we leave Gundu I want your lightest marching chains on these wretches,' he warned the merchants. 
he rose to his feet as a signal that the meeting was ended. It was a relief to leave the odious village and to go up into the hills above the lake where the air was sweeter and cooler, the view glorious. Dorian had sighted his camp upon the slopes. He had learned from his own experience that his men remained healthier if they were kept away from crowded villages, if the latrine pits were built away from the water supply and if the halal laws of food preparation were strictly observed. He had often wondered if the ritual washing before prayers also contributed to healthier troops. Certainly there were fewer diseases in his camps than his father had experienced on the crowded little English ships on which Dorian had sailed as a child. Although it was late afternoon by this time, his work was not yet finished for the day. There would be an early start tomorrow on the first leg of the march, and he had to review the order of his caravan. Five hundred of his own men, together with the female slaves, were to make up his decoy. The coloration of the captured slaves was almost purple-black. Not even the darkest complexioned of his Arabs were that color, so Dorian had used the infusion of tanning bark in which the lake fishermen soaked their nets to dye their bodies to a more natural African shade. It was still not perfect, but he depended on the dust and grime of the march to make the deception more effective. He had encountered further difficulties. None of his men would strip naked in public. Religious modesty forbade that, so he was forced to allow them to wear loincloths, although he made certain these were filthy and ragged. They had also balked at shaving their heads. But no African slave had flowing locks, and Dorian had insisted sternly. They would wear light chains, but these would not be locked and could be cast off in an instant. With very poor grace, the five merchants of Gandu had contributed a hundred elephant tusks to sweeten the bait. These were small and light, so that the men could carry their weapons in bundles on their heads along with the ivory. Dorian would lead the column, mounted, robed and veiled, just as the marauders would expect. He would keep Yassi close at hand. She had learned to ride astride on the march up from the coast. He would have a small detachment of Arab guards flanking the column, not so weak as to excite suspicion, but not so strong as to deter an attack. Bashir al-Sint would bring up the rear guard with another thousand fighting men, keeping two or three leagues back so that his dust would not be visible to the enemy scouts. The signal that the vanguard was under attack would be a red Chinese rocket. At the signal, Bashir would rush up and surround the attackers, while Dorian and his men would pin them down until Bashir could get his forces into position. It's a simple plan, Dorian decided, after he and Bashir had gone over it together for the tenth time. There will be many things we cannot foresee, but those are the chances of war, and we will counter each as it arises. Perhaps the Fisi will not come at all. Fisi was the Swahili word for hyena, and that was what they had called the marauders. They will come, Al-Salil, Bashir predicted. They have the taste for Omani blood now, and they are addicted to it. Pray to Allah that you are right, said Dorian, and went to his own tent, where the slave boy Yassi had his evening meal prepared for him. There is something about this that troubles me, said Abali as he studied the distant caravan through the lens. "'Share your anxiety with me,' Tom invited with scarcely veiled sarcasm. Abberley shrugged. "'Those men are small-boned, delicately built. They walk with a strange grace, light-footed as cats. I have never seen slaves much like that.' Three miles from where they lay in wait, the Arab caravan was descending the escarpment of the hills, winding down it like a serpent. They've been marching only a few weeks since leaving the lake country, Tom explained, for himself rather than for Abelie. They're still fresh and strong. He did not want to accept any evidence that might counsel against carrying out the attack. This was the first caravan of the dry season that they had been able to intercept, and he had feared that the source and wellspring of their fortunes had dried up. He was determined that this prize would not slip through his net. Yes, the men are young and strong, but look at the women. Tom took back the telescope and studied them. He felt a little stir of unease in his guts. The women were different in skin tone, age and body structure from their men. They are of a different tribe, Tom said, with more confidence in his tone than he felt. 
There are no children, said Aberley. Where are the children? God love you, Aberley, Tom was exasperated. Sometimes you could make a fresh plucked rose smell like a wet fart. They were both silent for a while. Tom swung the lens to the head of the caravan. The Arab headman rode on a grey dappled mare with rich trappings. At a glance Tom saw that he was a fine horseman, probably young. He rode tall and at ease in the saddle. He carried his long jezel slung over his back and his shield on his shoulder. A lance-bearer rode at his right hand, ready to pass across the weapon, and a young boy rode at his other hand. A hand-slave, or a favourite bum-boy, Tom guessed. The Arab wore the blue turban of the royal house of Oman, and the tail of the cloth was wound over the lower part of his face, so that only his eyes were exposed. I'd like to test his steel, Tom forced himself to ignore his own misgivings. By God, he looks as though he could give good account. The ivory is small, and by the ease with which they carry it, light, Abeli said softly. Tom rounded on him. I have come a hundred miles to gather in that ivory, light or heavy, and I mean to have it. I will not slink home again because you have had a bad dream, Abeli. Oh, I should never have told him about the dream, Abeli chided himself, then said aloud, I have followed you in every wild and reckless venture you have ever conceived, Glebby. Perhaps it is an old man's folly, but I intend to die at your side. So then, if you insist, let us go down and take these rich and easy pickings. Tom snapped the telescope shut and grinned at him. Let's not talk of dying on such a glorious day as this, old friend, he stood up. First we will cast their back trail, then go ahead of the column to find a good place to transact the main business. They went down to where Fundy held the horses at the base of the hill. Batula rode up to the head of the long column as it wound through the open forest and made his salute to Al-Salil. The Fizi are sniffing along our back trail, he reported. Dorian swung his horse out of the file. It skittered and threw its head. When? After we had gone into Bouvoac yesterday evening, two horsemen came up from the south, followed by two others on foot. What else did you make of them? When they dismounted to study our spore, both riders were shod with leather. Though they have savages with them, I think that these are Franks. They walked back and forth, then remounted and followed us. From a hill they overlooked our camp, then turned back into the south. Did it seem that they had become aware that Bashir al-Sint is following behind us? No, Lord. It seems to me that they are unaware. In Allah's name it begins, Dorian said with satisfaction. Make the signal to warn Bashir al-Sint that the Fizi are near, and that he can close up. Three innocent-looking cans of stones placed in a certain pattern in the road behind them would mean nothing to anyone except al-Sint. Batula rode back to the tail of the caravan. When he returned, he told Dorian, It is done as you ordered, Lord. Now take three men with you and ride ahead to find the place where they will most likely come at us, Dorian ordered. Ride openly and make no suspicious move. It was afternoon when Dorian saw the patrol returning. Batula rode up calmly. Lord, ahead of us there is such a place as favours the design of our enemies. Dorian waited for him to continue. Batula went on. Our head will reach the place in an hour. The road goes down another escarpment, winding through a narrow place between broken ground. Bowmen can lie concealed close on each hand. Halfway down there is an even steeper place. Here the path descends like a ladder, down natural stone steps. This is a place where they can cut our column in half. Yes, Dorian nodded. I remember this place from when we marched up from the coast. There is a river in the valley below with a pool where we rested for four days. It is the same place, Batula confirmed. That is where they will make their attack, Dorian said with certainty. For beyond the river is a wide plain of many days' march that does not suit their purpose so well. Above the natural stone ladder hung a crenellated buttress of red lichen-painted rock, a hundred feet high and rotten. It was split by deep vertical cracks and overhung the narrow pass below. 
Tom sat on the edge, swinging his feet over the top, and looked into the narrow passage. He had discovered and made note of this place two years earlier, after their first success against the slavers. No more than five horses can pass abreast, he estimated, and it's too rugged to ride them up or down it. They'll have to dismount and lead them. That was good, because the Lotzi archers had proved unreliable in the face of a cavalry charge. However, they were formidable fighters in confined hand-to-hand -hand encounters. There was not another place along all the hundreds of miles of the entire slave road that lent itself so perfectly to an ambush and the kind of fighting in which his men excelled. Under the supervision of Luke Jarvis, ten men were toiling over the broken ground behind where Tom sat. Each carried a fifty-pound keg of black powder on his back. Tom stood up and went to direct them to the mouth of the crack in the rocky buttress. They stacked the kegs, then threw themselves down to rest. Quickly, Aberly fashioned a crude bosun's chair from a plank and a coil of rope. With three of the men belaying the rope's end, he lowered himself into the crack. When he reached the bottom, they sent the powder kegs swaying down to him. Tom knew that Aberly could do this kind of work better than any, so he left him to it and made another circuit of the cliff's edge to check his dispositions and assure himself of their escape route if the attack failed. Sarah would wait with the horses in a bush-choked gully, well back from the fighting, but close enough if all turned against them and they were forced to make a run for it. When he returned to the mouth of the crack, he found that Abeli had finished placing the explosive and was being hauled up again. I have laid three separate fuses, he told Tom, and pointed to the long white snakes dangling down the rock face in case one might fail. Two hundred and fifty pounds, Tom grinned. That'll open their eyelids and loosen their teeth for them. They went back across the high broken ground, to a vantage point from which they could overlook the approaching slave caravan. They saw the dust cloud long before the column came into view among the trees of the open Mayombo forest. Tom studied the head of it through the lens, but could detect no change in the speed or composition of the column. The slaves still marched three and four abreast, their chains dangling and clanking. The Arab guards flanked them, and the blue-turbaned headmen still rode at the point. There is no singing, Aberley remarked. It was true, Tom realised. Always before there had been slaves singing. They must be a gloomy lot. The slave masters never use the whip on them, Abberley went on. Think of another clever reason for that, Clebe. Tom rubbed the lump of his broken nose. We have come across the only kind-hearted muscle men in Araby. You waste your breath, Abberley, and test my patience. These are mine, and I will have them. Abberley shrugged. It is not your fault, Clebe. Your father was a stubborn man, and your grandfather before him. It runs in the blood. Tom changed the subject. Do you think they'll camp tonight at the mouth of the pass, or come straight in? Aberley considered the height of the sun. If they attempt to make the passage this day, it will be dark before they are through. Darkness will suit our plans well enough. Put away your spyglass now, Clebby. They are close. The angle of the sun could send a flash of light down to them and startle the game. Dorian reined in his horse and stood in the saddle to survey the mouth of the pass. It opened gradually, the sides growing deeper and steeper as the ground fell away. He remembered the terrain clearly. He had memorised its perils when first he passed through it. It was the perfect place for an ambush. He felt the skin prickle at the nape of his neck, the premonition of danger which he trusted from long experience. Batula, take two men with you and go down the pass to scout it. That was what any prudent caravan master must do. Make a show of searching for sign, but if you discover any, do not call the alarm. Come back to me. Before you reach me, shout loudly that the road is clear and all is safe. Batula dipped his lance tip, rode into the pass, and disappeared beyond the first turn. Dorian dismounted stiffly, and behind him the long column shuffled to a halt. The slaves sank to the earth and set aside their loads. The slave boy, Yassi, set up a sunshade for the sheikh, then blew on the coals in the copper brazier that he carried on the back of his saddle. 
When they burst into bright flame, he placed the coffee pot over them. The coffee bubbled, and Yassi drew a thimble of it, then knelt to offer it to his master. Stay close to me when the fighting begins, Dorian whispered to Yassi. Under no circumstances pick up a weapon or make any warlike gesture. If you are menaced by an enemy, throw yourself down and scream for mercy. If you are captured, do not let them know you are a woman, lest they use you as one. As you command, Master. But with you at my side, I am not afraid of anything. Know that I love you, little one, and that I shall always love you. As I love you, Master. A shout from the mouth of the pass interrupted them. The road is clear and all is safe. Dorian looked up to see Batula waving his lance back and forth, the blue pennant fluttering at its tip. Dorian mounted and stood in the stirrups to give the forward command. That was all that was needed, for every one of his men knew his duty. Ponderously, the caravan rolled down into the moor of red rock. The walls of stone closed in upon them. This was one of the old elephant roads, and over the ages the pads of the great pachyderms had worn the rock floor smooth. Dorian wound the blue headcloth tighter over his mouth and nose, and without leaning forward to make it obvious, he examined the ground for recent sign of the marauders. The stone was clean, but that meant nothing. These were dangerous men, and they would not have been so careless as to mark the path. As the pass narrowed, the ranks of slaves and guards were compressed, until they marched with shoulders touching. There was no talking in the column, no singing, for none of the Arabs could imitate the cadence and rhythm of wild Africa. High on the wall of the pass, Dorian saw a flicker of movement, a tiny flash of grey. His heart skipped and beat faster. Then he saw that it was only a tiny clipspringer, one of the hair-sized gazelle that lived among the rocks. It stood poised on the crest of a boulder, all four minute hoofs held together, its straight horns and ears pricked, watching the men below with large, startled eyes. Halfway down the escarpment, the steep pitch began, as the pass squeezed between high portals of weathered, eroded rock, then dropped down a flight of natural stone stairs. Dorian swung off the saddle of the grey and led it down the treacherous footing. From the bottom, he looked back up the pitch. His soldiers' instincts crawled to see his men in such a cramped, perilous situation. They were confined in the narrow stone gut so cramped that they would only be able to swing an edged weapon or aim a musket with difficulty. He drew the horse off the path, and they squeezed against the wall to let the files of slaves and guards pass. Now he searched the walls on either side, looking for the flash of gun metal, the movement of a human head against the sky. There was nothing, and half the column was down the stone ladder. The second half of the caravan was squeezing through the red rock portals. It must come now. He judged the moment. They were fairly in the trap. He glanced back at Yassi. She had stopped close behind him and pulled her own horse off the track. She had wedged herself against a large boulder to let the files of men pass her. Dorian looked back at the sky. A single vulture was sailing in the tall blue on widespread pinions. It was a funereal black with a bald red head and hooked beak. It turned its head and looked down on the mass of men as it circled. Patience, foul bird, Dorian thought grimly. This day we will lay such a feast that will satiate even your lust for flesh. Before he could complete the thought, the air was driven in upon his eardrums with such force that he reeled backwards. It seemed as though a mighty vice had closed upon his chest, and the solid rock jumped and shivered beneath his feet. He saw a tower of smoke, dust, and red rock fragments shoot into the sky as high as the circling vulture. Then the earth was riven open, the buttress of rock split apart, the cliff shuddered, then swung outwards. It moved so slowly that he had time to think as he watched it. Black powder. I should have guessed it. They have blown out the buttress. The collapsing cliff fell more swiftly, rumbled, ground and roared. The screams of the men beneath it were puny and thin. It fell upon them and snuffed out their fruitless calls to God. The pass was blocked, and the long caravan cut in half like the body of a python divided by a single sword cut. 
While Dorian still clung to his horse's neck, his ears ringing and senses whirling, he saw the first flights of arrows dropping onto his men like clouds of locusts, and volleys of musket fire crashed down from the walls of the pass. Spurting powder smoke fogged the hot still air, and he heard the lead shot splattering like hail on stone and living flesh alike. A hundred or more of his men had been crushed under the avalanche. Less than fifty of his warriors had escaped below the still dust-smoking ruins. The rest of his force was cut off in the top end of the pass. In an instant he saw that the attackers had wrested the advantage, and he knew that in the next instant they would charge in to finish the bloody work they had begun so well. He swung up into the saddle and drew his scimitar. He and Batula were separated, but that was of little consequence, for the press was too close for lance work. It would be the sword and dagger when the fizzy came down. The slaves had thrown themselves flat, as he had ordered. As they crouched against the stone floor in simulated terror, they were slipping off their chains and drawing out their weapons from the bundles they had carried on their heads. From the saddle he saw the fizzy leap up from the ambush and storm down the steep sides, black men in war feathers brandishing light shields of rawhide, bounding from rock to rock, howling some savage war cry. They carried short spears and heavy clubs. Then, with astonishment, Dorian saw a white man in the van, then another, and a third. "'God is great!' Dorian roared. The crouching half-naked Arabs sprang up to beat the charge, scimitars in hand, and answered his cry. "'God is great! Allah Akbar!' Dorian spurred forward to reach a position from which he could command the battle. But a heavy lead musket ball took his horse in the shoulder with a thump, and it went down in a tangle of kicking limbs and equipment. Dorian jumped clear and landed lightly on his feet. All around him was uproar, but through it he heard a single voice sing out, Have at them, lads! Chop out their pagan bungholes! It was an English voice, rich with the earthy burr of Devon and it shocked Dorian more than the explosion of gunpowder. Englishman! He had not heard the language spoken in many a long year. Suddenly all those years were brushed away. These were his countrymen. He found himself caught up in a whirlpool of divided emotions. He looked about him for a way in which to halt the battle, to save the lives of his own troops and his countrymen, who were pitted against each other. But the war lance was sped, and it was too late to change its flight. He looked for Yassi. She was still cowering under the shelter of her boulder. But she shouted a high warning and pointed beyond him. At your back, Lord! Dorian whirled to meet the man who rushed at him. He was a big square-shouldered rogue, with a twisted nose and a curling bush of black beard. His face was deeply tanned by sun and wind. But there was something about his eyes, that green sparkle, that touched a deep chord in Dorian's memory. There was not a moment for him to dwell on it, for the man came at him with a speed and poise that belied his size. Dorian caught the first thrust, but it was so powerful that it thrilled his right arm to the shoulder. He went into repost, fluid and graceful, and the Englishman met him, caught his blade high in the natural line, and swept it into the classic prolonged engagement, rolling their two blades together so that the steel shrieked and sang. In that instant Dorian realised three things. That the Englishman was the finest swordsman he had ever faced, that if he tried to break he was a dead man, and that he recognised the sword that had trapped his own blade. He had last seen it hanging at his father's side as he stood on the quarter-deck of the old seraph. The blue steel and the gold inlay shimmered and dazzled the eye. It was unmistakable. Then his opponent spoke for the first time, his voice hardly blunted by the effort he was extending to keep Dorian's blade in check. Come, Abdullah, let me slice another inch off your bald prickhead for you. He spoke in Arabic, but Dorian knew that voice. Tom, he wanted to shout, but the shock was so intense that his voice choked in his throat and no sound reached his lips. The muscles in his right arm went soft and he dropped the point. No man living could afford to drop the point when Tom Courtney had him locked in prolonged engagement, and the killing stroke came like a flash of lightning out of a sunny blue summer sky. 
At the last moment, Dorian twisted aside, disturbing his brother's aim by a bare thumb's width. But then he felt the hit, high right in the chest, and the long slide of the steel into his flesh. The scimitar spun from his nerveless fingers, and he went down on his knees with the blade still in him. Tom! He tried to call his name again, but no sound came. Tom reared back, plucking the steel out of his chest with a soft sucking sound, like an infant releasing the teat. Dorian toppled forward onto his face. Tom stepped over him and sighted down the blade to finish it. Before he could make the killing stroke, a small body hurled itself between them, covering Dorian's body protectively. Damn you! Tom shouted, but held the stroke. Get out of this! The boy, who was using his own body as a shield, was a mere child, and the act of sacrifice touched Tom even in this battle rage. He could have killed them both with a single thrust, through and through, but he could not bring himself to do it. He stepped back and tried to kick the youth off the Arab headman's supine body, but the little fellow clung to his master like an oyster to a rock. He was screaming pitifully in Arabic, Mercy! In the name of Allah, mercy! At that moment, Abeli shouted a warning, At your back, Klebi! Tom spun round, his point high, to meet the rush of two half-naked men. For an instant he thought they were slaves who had been released miraculously from their chains and were now attacking him with scimitars they had conjured up from who knew where. Then he saw that their features were not Negroid but Arabic. By God, they were not slaves at all, but fighting musclemen. He countered right and left, bringing them up short, then killed one and sent the other staggering away with a slash across his bare shoulder. Clebby, it is a trap! Abeli roared again, and Tom had a moment to look around. Every one of the erstwhile slaves was free of his chains and armed. They were swift and purposeful in their counter-attack. Already the Lotzi spearmen were breaking up before their onslaught, and most were in flight, scrambling back up the sides of the gorge in wild disarray. From the front of the column Tom saw a red Chinese rocket whoosh into the sky on a long tail of white smoke and knew that it must be a signal to bring Arab reinforcements swarming down on them. Over the tumbled wall of red rock that blocked the back section of the pass came a wave of more musclemen, some in robes, the others in loincloths, rushing down to join the fight. Aberley and the little band of English seamen were already far outnumbered. Within minutes they would be cut off and overwhelmed by this fresh tide of warriors. Get out, Clebby! It is lost! Get out! On me! Tom bellowed. On me, the Centaurus! He called the others to him. Alf Wilson and Luke Jarvis broke through the enemy ranks and ran to his side. With Abeli and all the remaining seamen, they formed a circle of steel and retreated in the formation they had practised so often. With their headmen down and out of the fighting, the Arabs seemed suddenly indecisive and reluctant to press themselves onto the hedge of swords. Tom reached the point at the foot of the cliff from where they could begin the climb back and snapped, Away with you, lads! Every man for himself, and the devil take the hindmost! They climbed hand over hand, sweating and cursing and panting. Before they reached the top, the Arabs below had rallied and sent the first volleys of musket fire thudding into the rocks around them, loose chips showering on their heads and the ricochets humming away. One of the English seamen was struck. The ball caught him in the back. He arched out and loosened his grip, then went sliding and rolling down the face. Tom glanced back, and the moment his man reached the bottom, he saw the Arabs swarm over his body and cut him to pieces. Nothing we can do for poor Davy. Keep climbing, he grunted. Tom and Aberley scrambled over the crest together and were shielded from the fire below. They paused to draw breath and rally the others around them. The sweat was streaming down Aberley's scarified face, and when he looked at Tom, he shook his great bald head, needing no words to express his feelings eloquently. Do not say it, Aberley. You have proved once again that you are as wise as God, but somewhat older and not so beautiful. Tom laughed raggedly, still out of breath. Come on, lads! Let's get back to the horses. Sarah was holding them in the dense bush of the gully. She took one look at their faces as they came scrambling back, dragging two wounded men with them, and asked no questions. Most of them were cut and bleeding, and all were drenched with sweat. 
There was not enough mounts for all, so Tom took Sarah up behind his saddle. Luke had one of the wounded with him, Alf Wilson the other, while the rest of the seamen grabbed a stirrup leather each and were dragged along as they headed back into the south. The Lotsey warriors had scattered long before into the bush. We have brought the whirlwind down upon ourselves. They will send an army after us, said Aberley. Our days at Fort Providence have come to an end, Tom agreed, riding hard beside him. Thank God the Centaurus has no cargo to carry. The river is low, but she will ride light, and we can be away down river before the muscle men can catch up with us. Dorian lay where he had fallen in the gut of the pass. Ben Abram, the old surgeon, would not allow them to move him until he had placed a compress on the wound and bound it up tightly to staunch the bleeding. It has missed the heart and the lung, he said grimly, but he is still in mortal danger. They made a litter out of lance shafts and a leather tent fly, and eight men carried him gently through the shambles of the battlefield, where the other wounded groaned and called for water. Yasmini walked beside the litter. She had wound her headcloth tightly over her face to stifle her sobs and hide her tears. When they reached the grove of tall shade trees beside the river pool at the foot of the escarpment, the camp servants had already recovered the sheikh's tent from among the scattered baggage and set it up. They laid Al-Salil on his sleeping mat and propped him on the silk cushions. Ben Abraham gave him a draught of the poppy and he sank into an uneasy doze. He will not die, Yasmini pleaded with Ben Abram. Please tell me he will not die, old father. He is young and strong. With God's grace he will live, but it will take time for him to recover and to regain the use of his right arm. I will stay by his side and will not rest until he does. I know you will, child. Within the hour there were loud voices outside the tent. Yassi flew out to protect her lord and drive them away, but even in his drugged state Dorian recognised the voices of Bashir al-Sint and Batula. Let them enter, he called weakly, and Yassi had to stand aside. Bashir bowed at the entrance. Lord Sheikh, I call down Allah's protection upon you. What of the enemy? We came up as soon as we saw the rocket, but we were too late. They had escaped. How many of the enemy were killed? Many black coffers, and three Franks. Was one of the Franks a big man with a black beard? Bashir shook his head. None of them. Two were small and thin. One bigger infidel had a grey beard. Dorian felt a surge of relief. Tom had escaped. Then Batula spoke unbidden, his voice sharp and eager. Lord! I have followed the sign of those Fizi who fled the battlefield. They had horses hidden close by and are running south, moving fast. But give the order, and we will follow them. Bashir cut in as eagerly. Al Salil, I have a thousand men ready and mounted, eager to hunt them down. I wait only for your order, and then, by Allah, none will survive. No! The exclamation was torn from Dorian in pain and Bashir blinked at the strength of his refusal. Forgive my impertinence, great lord, but I do not understand. It was the centrepiece of our plans that we hunt down the infidel bandits. You are not to follow them. I forbid it. Dorian mustered all the force he had left to emphasize the order. If we do not follow at once, they will get clear away. Bashir saw the chance for glory snatched from him and glanced across at Ben Abram. Perhaps the severity of your wound has clouded your judgment, mighty lord. Dorian struggled up on one elbow. In the name of Allah, I swear this. If you flout my orders, I will carry your head on the point of my lance and bury your body in a pigskin. There was a long silence. Then at last Bashir spoke softly. Will the great lord Al-Salil repeat these orders in front of the senior officers of the staff? that they may bear witness that it is not cowardice on my part that kept me in bait while the beaten enemy escaped. The four senior officers came to the tent, and Dorian repeated his command in front of them, then sent them away. When Bashir made to follow them, Dorian stopped him. 
There are matters here so deep that I cannot explain to you, Bashir. Forgive me that I seem to disparage you. Know only that you are still high in my favour. Bashir bowed, touched his heart and his lips, but his expression was cold and aloof as he backed out of the tent. Outside they heard him shouting angry orders to his troops to stand down. Dorian seemed to sink into a deep sleep. The silence in the tent was heavy, and Yasmini wiped the sweat from his brow with a damp cloth. After a long while, Dorian stirred and opened his eyes. He looked first at her and then at Ben Abram. Are we alone? he asked, and they both nodded. Come closer, old father. There is aught I must tell you. When Yasmini made as if to rise and leave the tent, he laid a hand on her arm to restrain her. As they both hovered over him, Dorian said quietly, The man who struck me down was my brother. That was why I could not send Bashir after him. Is this possible, Dawi? Yasmini stared into his eyes. Yes, Ben Abram spoke for him. I know his brother, and it is possible. Tell her, please, old father. I find it tiring to speak. Explain it to her. Ben Abram took a minute to gather his words, then began to speak softly so that no one outside the tent could hear him. He told Yasmini how Dorian had been captured as a child and sold into slavery, how Al-Malik had bought him from the pirates and adopted him. I met him face to face, this brother of Al-Salil. I came to know him well on the island after he had destroyed the lair of the pirates. His name is Tom. I was his captive, but he set me free and sent me with a message to Al-Salil. He promised that he would never give up searching for him, and that one day he would find him and rescue him. Yasmini looked to Dorian for confirmation, and he nodded. Then why did he not hold to his oath to free you, this loyal brother of yours? she asked. Dorian looked abashed. I cannot answer that, he admitted. Brother Tom was never one to take his oath lightly. I suppose in the end, after all the years, he simply forgot me. No, said Ben Abram. There was something you never knew, and that I could not tell you. Your brother came back to Zanzibar, searching for you. The Prince al-Malik would not surrender you. He sent the Mullah al-Alama with a message to your brother. He told him that al-Amkhara was dead of the fever, and they had placed a marker in the cemetery with your name upon it. That was when my father changed my name to al-Salil. Dorian's voice became stronger and sharper as he understood. It was to hide the truth from Tom. No wonder my brother gave up the search for me. He closed his eyes and was silent. Yasmini thought he had fallen into a coma, but then she saw a single tear squeeze out between his closed lids. Her heart contracted with pity for him. What will you do, my love? She stroked his fiery red head. I know not, he said. It is all too cruel. I feel a sword dividing my soul. You are of Islam now, Ben Abram said. Can you ever go back to your origins? Would your brother believe that you are alive after you have been dead to him all these years? Yasmini asked. And can you embrace him now when he is the swarm enemy of your father, the Caliph al-Malik, and of your god and your people? Ben Abraham twisted the knife in his heart. Dorian had no answer for either of them. He turned his face to the leather wall of the tent and took refuge in his weakness from the wound. Yasmini never left his side while he drifted in and out of consciousness, tormented by physical pain and by the emotional forces that tore at his heart and threatened to rend it apart. 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 Track 17.
The army stagnated for days in the camp below the escarpment, while their sheikh lay sequestered in his tent. Under Bashir's direction, they gathered in the wounded and built thatched shelters for them beneath the shade trees. Ben Abram tended them. They buried their dead, but left undisturbed those who were already interred beneath the red rock of the avalanche. They repaired the smashed equipment and resharpened their weapons. Then they waited for further orders. None came. Bashir al Sint strode angrily through the camp, lashing out at any man who crossed his path, and the men shared his frustration. They burned for a chance to avenge their comrades, who had died in the narrows of the pass, but they could not move without the orders of al-Salil. Ugly rumours spread through the camp that Bashir would rebel and take over command from the ailing sheikh, that the sheikh had died, that he had recovered, that he had sneaked away in the night and left them to their fate. Then another stranger rumour flared through the ranks that a second grand expeditionary force under the command of a prince of the royal house of Oman was marching up from the coast to join them. With this combined force, they would be allowed at last to pursue the infidel into his lair. This rumour was only hours old when they heard the low thump of distant war drums, at first so soft that it seemed to be the beating of their own hearts. The Arab soldiers crowded the high ground to look out across the plain and thrilled to the blast of a ram's horn trumpet. They saw a splendid host approaching, with a staff of high-ranking officers riding at the head. They gathered in awe as these strangers rode into the camp. The officer who led the cohorts wore half-armour in the Turkish style, with pot-shaped helmets, spiked on top and with a padded neck flap. From the back of his horse, this splendid figure addressed them in ringing tones. I am Prince Ibn al-Malik Abu Bakr. Men of Oman, loyal soldiers and true, I bring you sad tidings. Abd Muhammad al-Malik... My father and your caliph is dead in the Moscat palace, struck down in his prime by the sword of the black angel. A groan went up from the ranks, for most of them had fought at Muscat to place al-Malik on the elephant throne, and they had loved their caliph. They threw themselves down on their knees and cried out, May God have mercy on his soul! Abu Bakr let them give expression to their sorrow, then he held up a gloved hand for their silence. Soldiers of the Caliph, I bring you salutations from your new ruler, Zain al-Din, beloved elder son of al-Malik, who is now the Caliph. He bids me call you to swear allegiance and loyalty to him. They knelt in rows with Bashir al-Sint at the head of the army and swore the oath of fealty, calling on God to witness it. By the time the ceremony was over, the sun was setting. Then Abu Bakr dismissed them and called Bashir to him. Where is that coward and traitor, Al-Salil? he demanded. On behalf of the Caliph, I have urgent business with him. Dorian heard the pronouncement of his adoptive father's death while he lay on the sleeping mat in his tent for Abu Bakr's voice carried clearly through the leather sidewall. It seemed that all the foundations of his life were being torn out one at a time. He felt too weak and sick to surmount these shocks and hardships. Then he heard Zain al-Din's name and the news of his accession to the elephant throne, and realised that his predicament was even worse than he had fancied. With a vast effort he put aside his sorrow for his father, and his own debilitating physical suffering, took Yasmini's hand and drew her closer to his bed. She was shaken by the news of Al-Malik's death, but not as deeply as Dorian, for she had hardly known her father as a man. She recovered from her sorrow swiftly when he shook her. We're in great danger, Yassi. Now we are both completely in Zain's power. I do not have to tell you what that means, for Kush was a saint in comparison to our brother. But how can we escape him? For you cannot move, Dawi. What can we do? He told her what she must do for them, speaking softly and urgently, making her repeat every detail. I would give you a written letter, but I cannot write with this arm. You must carry my message by word of mouth alone, but learn it well, for otherwise it will not be believed. She was quick-witted, 
and even in her confused state she memorised it all perfectly at the first attempt, although she had difficulty in enunciating some of the words he taught her. There was no time for her to perfect them. That'll do. He'll understand. Now go, he ordered her. I cannot leave you, Lord, she pleaded. Abu Bakr will recognise you if you stay by me. In his clutches you will be no help to either of us. She kissed him once, tenderly and lovingly, then rose to leave him. But there came a heavy tramp outside the tent, and she shrank back into a corner, covered her head and shoulders with her shawl. At that moment the tent flap was thrown open, and Bashir al-Sint stepped in. Ben Abram tried to intervene and prevent him approaching the bed on which Dorian lay. Al-Salil is sorely wounded and must not be disturbed. Bashir pushed him aside contemptuously. General Abu Bakr, the emissary of the Caliph, approaches, he warned Dorian, and his expression was cold and malicious. Dorian knew that he had changed allegiance and was no longer his loyal friend and ally. Behind him, Abu Bakr stepped into the tent and stood with his hands on his hips. So, the traitor yet lives. That is good. Al-Salil, who was once Al-Amkhara, in the Zenana at Lamu, where we were playmates, he sniggered sarcastically. I have come to take you to the Caliph to answer capital charges of treason. We will march for the coast tomorrow at dawn. Ben Abram intervened again. Noble Prince, he cannot be moved. His wound is grievous. It will endanger his very life. Abu Bakr stepped close to the bed and looked down at Dorian. A wound, you say? How can I be certain he is not shirking? Suddenly he reached down and grasped the padded dressing that covered Dorian's chest. With one brutal gesture he ripped it away. The fresh-formed scab was stuck to the bandage, and as it came away Dorian stiffened and hissed with agony. Fresh blood started from the wound and trickled down his chest. In the corner of the tent Yasmini whimpered with sympathy, but none of them took notice of her. It is but a mere scratch. Abu Bakr gave his opinion as he pretended to examine the open wound. Not enough to keep a traitor from justice. He grabbed a handful of Dorian's thick red hair and dragged him from the bed. Get on your feet, traitor pig. He pulled Dorian upright. See, doctor, how strong is your patient. He has been duping you. There is little wrong with him. Noble prince, he will not survive such treatment or the long march to the coast. Ben Abram, you doddering old goat, if he dies before we reach the coast, I will have your head. Let it be a contest between you and me. He smiled and showed all his uneven teeth. You must do your best to keep Al-Salil alive. For my part, I will do my best to kill him by degrees. We shall see who wins. He threw Dorian back onto his sleeping mat and turned to stride out of the tent. Bashir followed him. Yasmini sprang up and rushed to Dorian. Although his face was contorted with agony, he whispered to her fiercely, Go, woman. Waste not another moment. Find Batula and ride. Tom and his band reached Fort Providence in three days of hard riding and immediately started to make preparations to abandon the settlement. Abali sent Fundi and three of his men upriver to fetch his family. I cannot sail without them he told Tom simply. I would not expect that, Tom replied, but they must make haste. We can be sure the muscle men are hard on our tracks. Tom sent out pickets to cover all the approaches to the fort, so that they would have warning when the Arab forces appeared. Then, in haste, they began to load the Centaurus for her departure down the Lunga River. They fetched the light nine-pounder cannon from the emplacements on the stockade wall and placed them in their carriages on the upper deck. There was no ivory to take with them, but they reloaded all the trade goods they had brought up from Good Hope at the beginning of the season. Sarah gathered all her treasures and brought them aboard, the linen and cutlery, pots and pans, medical stores and books, almost filling their tiny cabin. Tom argued about the harpsichord. I'll buy you another, he promised, but when he saw that peculiar expression of hers he knew he was wasting his breath. With poor grace he allowed two seamen to carry it up the gangplank, and sway it down into the hold. It was strange, but still there was no sign of pursuit from the north, 
and Tom sent out Aberley to make certain that the pickets covering the northern trails were alert and at their posts. This calm was unnatural. Surely retribution must come soon. The days passed. Then, at last, Fundy returned downriver from Lotsiland with two dugout canoes carrying Zeti and Fala, the two boys Zama and Tula, and the new babies. Sarah took them all under her wing. Tom sent an urgent messenger after Aberley, bidding him bring in the pickets, for all was at last in readiness for the departure. Two days later, there was a shout from the sentry on the watchtower above the fort. Riders, coming from the north! Tom climbed up the ladder, telescope in hand. Where away? he demanded, and when the sentry pointed, he focused the telescope. Sarah climbed up to the top of the tower beside him. Who is it? she asked anxiously. It's Aberley bringing in the pickets. He whistled softly with relief and satisfaction. And no sign of pursuit. It looks as though we might get clear away without a fight. I had not thought that possible. I cannot understand why the musclemen have let us off so lightly. Get all your little brats on board. We will shove off down river as soon as Aberley steps on deck. She started down the ladder, but he stopped her with another whistle. Aberley is bringing in two strangers. Arabs, by God. Prisoners, by the look of it. For Aberley has them well trussed up. He has bagged himself a couple of enemy scouts. Like as not, they will be able to tell us where their main force is. Tom and Sarah were waiting for them when Aberley marched his captives aboard the Centaurus. What fine fish are these you have netted, Aberley? Tom asked as he eyed them. By their apparel they were Arabs, one a warrior, and a dangerous one by the look of him. The other was a slip of a boy, a pretty lad with big dark eyes, who was timid and fearful. An unlikely pair, Tom said. The boy seemed encouraged by his easy tone. Effendi, you speak my language, he asked softly, and his voice was sweet and unbroken. Yes, boy, I speak Arabic. Your name is Tom. Damn you, you little scamp! Tom frowned and stepped towards him threateningly. How did you know that? Tom, wait! Sarah stopped him. She is a girl. Tom stared hard into Yasmini's face, then laughed. He snatched off her headcloth, and her long, dark hair tumbled around her shoulders. So she is, and a mighty pretty one, too. Who are you? I am the Princess Yasmini, and I bring you a message from Dawi. From who? From Dowie. She looked desperate. Dowie! Dowie! She repeated it with different inflections, but Tom shook his head, puzzled. I think she's trying to say Dory, Sarah intervened, and relief rushed across Yasmini's face. Yes! Yeah, yes! Dowie! Dowie, your brother! Tom's face turned ugly, swelling with dark blood. You come here to mock me. My brother Dory has been dead these many years. What are you playing at, you little bitch? Is this a trap? He shouted into her face. Her eyes welled with tears, but she drew herself up and began to sing. Her voice was hesitant at first, but then it steadied, became sweet and true. But she sang in the semi-quavers of the Orient, alien to the European ear. The tune was twisted and the words were a parody of the English language. They all stared at her in total incomprehension. Then Sarah gasped, Tom, it's Spanish ladies. She's trying to sing Spanish ladies. She rushed forward and embraced Yasmini. It must be true. Dorian is alive. And the song is his sign that this girl comes from him. Dorian? Is it possible? Where is he? Tom grabbed one of Yasmini's arms and shook it violently. Where is my brother? It came out in a garbled rush of words. Yasmini started another sentence before she had finished the one that preceded it, tripping over her tongue in her haste to tell it all and leaving much out so that she had to go back and start again. Dory needs help. Tom picked out the essentials and turned to Aberley. Dory is alive and in dire straits and has sent them to fetch us. The horses are still saddled, Aberley said calmly. We can ride at once. Tom turned back to Yasmini, who was still gabbling out her story to Sarah. Enough, girl, he stopped her. 
There'll be time later to tell the rest of it. Can you take us to Dory? Yes, she said vehemently. Batula and I can lead you to him. Tom leaned down from the saddle to give Sarah a final hasty kiss. For once she had not insisted on accompanying this expedition. Tom should have realised by this unusual behaviour and by her recent reticence that something was afoot, but he was so distracted that he gave it not a thought. Make sure Alf Wilson keeps everyone aboard and all secure. When we return, we will be in great haste, like as not with half of Araby hard on our heels. He gathered the reins, lifted his horse's head, and looked around for the others. Yasmini and Batula had already started, and were halfway up the first hill above the Lunga River. Luke and Abeli were hanging back, waiting for Tom to catch up with them. Everyone was dressed in Arab robes and led a spare horse on a rein. Tom clapped his heels into his horse's flanks and waved back at Sarah as it bounded forward under him. Come back soon and safe, Sarah called after him, with one hand pressed lightly to her stomach. It had taken them four days riding hard, changing horses every hour, using every glimmer of light from dawn to the brief African dusk to catch up with the Arab column. Tom had ridden beside Yasmini all the way, and they had talked until their throats were dry with the dust and the heat. She had told him everything that had happened to Dorian since she had first met him in the Zenana until his arrest by Abu Bakr only days before. This time her story was coherent and lucid, touched with humour and pathos, so at times Tom laughed with delight and at others was moved to the brink of tears. She showed him what type of man Dorian had become and made Tom proud. She told him of her and Dorian's love for each other and in the process won Tom's affection and liking. He was enchanted by her pretty sparkle and her sunny nature. So now you will be my little sister, he smiled at her fondly. I like that, Effendi. She smiled back. It makes me very happy. If I am to be your brother, you must call me Tom. When she reminded him of the fight in the pass and explained how he had cut down his own brother, nearly run her through too, he was smitten with remorse. He never showed his face. How could I know? He understands, Tom. He loves you still. I might have killed both of you. It was as though something outside me held my hand. God's ways are marvellous, and not for us to question. She led him through the complicated maze of royal Omani politics, explained how they had been caught up in them, and the consequences to Dorian of Zain al-Din's accession to the Caliphate. So now Abu Bakr takes him back to Muscat to face the spite and vengeance of Zain, she said, and the tears ran down her dusty face. He leaned across and patted her arm like a brother. We will see to that, Yasmini. Please do not weep. They cut the wide, deep spore of the marching Arab army and closed in on it until they could make out the dust cloud above the forest. Then Batula went ahead while the rest hung back and waited until night fell. He would be able to infiltrate the loose mass of veiled riders without drawing attention or suspicion. Just as the sun was setting, he returned along the back trail. Praise God! Al-Salil is still alive, were his first words. To Tom, the use of Dorian's Arab name still sounded strange. I have seen him from afar, but did not try to reach him. They bear him on a drag litter behind a horse. How strong did he seem? Tom demanded. He can walk a little, Batula replied. I saw Ben Abram help him from the litter and lead him to the tent where they have him now. His right arm is still in a sling. He moves slowly, stiffly, like an old man, but he carries his head high. He is stronger than when we left him. Praise God's name, whispered Yasmini. Can you lead us to his tent, Batula? Tom asked. Batula nodded. Yes, but they guard him well. Have they put chains on him? No, Effendi. They must consider his wound enough restraint. We will bring him out this very night, Tom decided. And this is how we will do it. They approached the camp from upwind, so that their horses would not smell those of the Arabs and whinny to them. 
They left Yasmini to hold them and went forward to the edge of the forest. The camp was as murmurous as a beehive, and the air was blue and thick with the smoke of hundreds of cooking fires. There was constant movement, grooms and slaves coming and going from the horse lines, men drifting into the surrounding bush on personal business and returning to their sleeping mats, the cooks bearing steaming rice pots through the camp and doling out the evening meal. Few sentries were set, and little order enforced. Abu Bakr is not a real soldier, Batula said contemptuously. Al-Salil would never allow such a lack of discipline. Tom sent Batula into the camp first, and the rest followed him singly at intervals, moving casually, veiled and robed with their weapons concealed. Batula went towards a hollow in the centre of the encampment, where a leather tent had been set up in isolation from the others. In the firelight, Tom saw that the scrub around it had not been cleared, but that at least three guards were posted around it. They squatted with their weapons across their laps. Batula settled down under a twisting branched marula tree, a hundred yards from the prison tent. The others came up casually and joined him, squatting in a circle and spreading their robes around them, until, in the semi-darkness, they seemed like any of the other small groups of Omani soldiers scattered about, talking softly, drinking coffee and sharing a pipe. Suddenly there was a stir as a group of three splendidly apparelled Arabs came striding towards them, followed closely by their bodyguards. Tom felt a flutter of panic, certain that somehow their presence had been discovered, but the men passed close by them and went on towards the tent. He with the blue headcloth and gold rope is Prince Abu Bakr, the one I told you of, whispered Batula. The other two are Alcint and Bintati, both fierce soldiers and liegemen of Abu Bakr. Tom watched the three enter the tent in which Dorian lay prisoner. They were close enough to hear the murmur of voices from behind the leather walls. Then came the sound of a blow and a cry of pain. Tom half rose to his feet, but Abeli reached out a hand and drew him down. There was more talking within the tent. Then Abu Bakr stooped out through the fly and paused to look back. Keep him alive, Ben Abram that he may die with more passion. Abu Bakr laughed and came back, passing so close that Tom could have touched the hem of his robe. Salam alaikum, mighty lord, Tom murmured. But Abu Bakr never glanced in his direction and went on to where his own tent stood in the centre of the encampment. Slowly a hush settled. The voices died away, men curled up in their shawls around the fires and the flames burned down to ash. Tom and his men lay down around the small fire Batula had built and covered their heads, but did not sleep. As the fires died, the darkness deepened. Tom watched the stars to judge the passage of time. It went infinitely slowly. At last he reached across and touched Abeli's back. It is time. He stood up slowly and moved towards Dorian's tent. He had been watching the sentry who sat at the rear. He had seen his head droop, then come up with a jerk, only to droop again. Tom walked up softly behind him, leaned over him, and struck him across the temple with the barrel of his pistol. He felt the thin bone break, and the man sagged forward without a sound. Tom squatted in his place, assuming the same position with the man's musket across his lap. He waited for a long minute to make certain that there was no alarm. Then he eased himself forward on his haunches until he was close to the rear wall of the tent. He had no way of knowing if they had posted a guard inside the tent at Dorian's bedside. He wet his lips, drew breath, then softly whistled the opening bar of Spanish ladies. Someone stirred behind the leather wall, and then came a voice he did not remember. It was not like the voice of the child Dorian when they had parted. It was the voice of a man. Tom! Aye, lad, is it safe within? Only Ben Abram and me. Tom slipped out his jackknife, and the leather wall of the tent fell apart beneath the blade. A hand reached out to him through the gap, pale in the starlight. Tom seized it, squeezed hard, and Dorian drew him through the gap into the tent where they embraced kneeling chest to chest. Tom started to speak, but his voice was choked. He hugged Dorian with all his strength, 
and drew another breath. God love you, Dorian Courtney. I know not what to say. Tom! Dorian reached up with his good hand and seized a handful of the thick, dust-stiff curls at the back of his brother's head. It's so good to see you. The English words were alien on his tongue, and he was weeping, overwhelmed by the weakness of his wound and by a towering joy. Don't do that, Dorry, or you'll set me off, Tom protested, and pulled away to wipe his eyes on the back of his arm. Let's get you out of here, lad. How badly are you hurt? Can you walk if Abberley and I help you? Abberley, is he here with you? Dorian's voice trembled. I am here, bon vous, Abberley rumbled beside his ear. But there will be time for all this later. He had dragged in the fallen sentry through the cut in the tent wall. Now Tom and he rolled the Arab onto the sleeping mat and covered his body with Dorian's woolen blanket. In the meantime, Ben Abram was helping Dorian into his robe, covering those shining red curls with a turban. Go with God, Al Salil, he whispered, and turned to Tom. I am Ben Abram. Do you remember me? I shall never forget you and your kindness to my brother, old friend. Tom gripped his arm. All God's blessings be upon you. You have kept your oath, Ben Abram said softly. Now you must gag and bind me, else Abu Bakr will treat me cruelly when he finds Al-Salil gone. They left Ben Abram trussed up and took Dorian through the back wall. Outside the tent they lifted him to his feet and supported him between them. Then they started slowly through the sleeping camp. Batula and Luke Jarvis went ahead, moving like dark ghosts, and they skirted one of the campfires. A sleeping Arab stirred, sat up, and stared at them as they passed close to where he lay, but let them go unchallenged, sank down to the earth again, and covered his head again. Bear up, Dory, Tom whispered in his ear. Nearly out of it. They went on towards the edge of the forest, and as the trees closed around them, Tom almost exclaimed aloud with relief. But at that moment a harsh voice challenged them in Arabic from close at hand. What manner of men are you? Stand in God's name and deliver yourselves. Tom reached for the sword under his robe, but Dorian caught his hand and replied in the same language. The peace of Allah on you, friend. I am Mustafa of Muhaid, and I am devoured by the dysentery. My friends, take me to a private place in the bush. Oh, you are not alone in your suffering, Mustafa. There is much of the sickness in the camp, the sentry sympathized. Peace upon you and on your bowels also. They moved on slowly. Suddenly Batula appeared again out of the night. This way, Effendi, he whispered. The horses are close. They heard the stamp of a hoof, and suddenly Yasmini's small figure detached itself from the darkness and raced to Dorian. They clung to each other, exchanging embraces and soft, loving whispers, until Tom drew them gently apart and led Dorian to the strongest horse. Between them, Abberley and Tom boosted him into the saddle, where he swayed unsteadily. Tom tied his ankles together with a leather thong stretched under the horse's belly, and they swung Yasmini up behind him. Hold him steady, little sister, Tom told him. Do not let him slide off. He mounted his own horse and took the lead rein of Dorian's mount. Take us home, Abberley, he said, and looked back through the trees towards the sleeping camp. We will not have more than a few hours' start at best. Then they will be after us like a swarm of hornets. They used the horses cruelly. The animals had been driven hard on the ride up from Fort Providence, given almost no rest and time to graze, except during the brief night halts. Now the treatment was the same on the ride back. It was baking hot at noon, and the stretches between water were long. The hard ground and flinty stones ripped into the animals' hoofs. They lost the first horse before they'd gone twenty miles. It was the mount carrying Dorian and Yasmini. It went stone lame in all four hoofs and could barely hobble. Tom turned it loose, knowing in his heart that lions and hyena would have the brave beast that same night. They put Dorian up on one of the spares and went on at the same pace. 
By the third day they had burned up all the spare horses and had only those they rode. As they were about to mount again after the brief noon stop at a muddy waterhole, Abberley said quietly, The muskets will be no use to us against an army, and the weight is killing the horses. They abandoned their firearms and powder flasks, shot bags and every stick of baggage, keeping only their edged weapons and the water skins. Tom turned his back so that none would see what he did, and slipped one of the loaded pistols into his belt below his shirt. It was a double-barrelled weapon. He knew from what Yasmini had told him of the fate that awaited her and Dorian if the Arabs caught up with them. The pistol was for them, one barrel each. God, give me the strength to do it when the time comes, he prayed silently. Though they had drastically lightened the load, they lost another two horses that day. Luke, Abberley and Tom took turns trotting beside the mounted men, hanging onto the stirrup leathers to keep up with the driving pace of the march. That evening, for the first time, they spotted the pursuing column of Arabs. They were crossing another line of those hills that ran with the grain of this wild country. When they looked back, they saw the dust cloud rising three leagues behind them. That night they stopped only for an hour, then went on by starlight, following the high beacon of the Great Cross in the constellation of Centaurus. Despite this long night march, and that the Arabs must be burning up their mounts even as they were, they discovered when the dawn broke that they had gained no ground on the pursuit. In the early sunlight the dust cloud rose red as blood on the horizon, still three leagues behind them. During the night marches, even Abberley had lost all sense of distance covered and their exact position in this wilderness of forest and broken hilly country. That evening they crossed another line of hills, hoping to see the shining waters of the Lunga below them, but their hopes were dashed as ahead rose yet another line of green hills. They struggled across the intervening valley, the horses almost finished, and all of them nearing the limit of their endurance. Even Abberley was suffering, trying to conceal the limp caused by a strained ligament in his knee. His face was dry and dusty grey, with all the moisture sweated out of him. Dorian was gaunt, his body skeletal beneath his robe, his wound weeping fresh blood from under the filthy dressing. Yasmini had almost exhausted the last of her strength, trying to hold him in the saddle. The last horse staggered under their combined weight. It fell just below the crest of the hills, going down as though it had taken a musket ball through the brain. Tom cut the thong that held Dorian's ankles together and dragged him out from under it. It's Shanks's pony from here, lad. Can you go on? he asked him. Dorian tried to smile. I can go on as long as you can, Tom. But when Tom tried to lift him, his knees gave way under him and he sagged to the stony ground. Close behind them, the red dust cloud rose in the valley they had just crossed. They cut a short pole and Abberley and Tom took the ends. They sat Dorian in the middle of it placing his arms around their shoulders and staggered down the side of the hill into the valley, carrying him between them. They stopped during the night for a few minutes at a time, then picked up Dorian on his pole and carried him forward until they could not take another pace and sagged to the ground for another rest. It took them all that night to cross the wide valley. They could only hope that the pursuit had halted in the dark behind them, unable to follow their spoor. Dawn caught them toiling up the slope on the far side of the valley. When they looked back, the Arabs were so close that their lance tips caught the early light and twinkled merrily. They've halved the distance, Tom gasped, as they lowered Dorian to the ground for another rest. At the speed we are making, they will be up to us in an hour. Leave me here, Tom, Dorian whispered. Save yourselves. You are mad, Tom cried. The last time I turned my back on you, you were gone for years. I'll not take that risk again. They hoisted him and set off again. Yasmini was walking a few paces ahead. Her leather sandals were ripped and torn almost off her feet, and her heels were bleeding where the blisters had burst open. She fell before they reached the crest, and though she crawled to the nearest tree and tried to use the trunk to pull herself upright, she was too weak to regain her feet. Luke, take my place here. You, Batula, help him. 
Tom handed over the end of the carrying pole to them and went to where Yasmini crouched against the tree, sobbing softly. I am a stupid, weak woman, she wept as he stooped over her. Yes, he agreed, but much too pretty to leave behind. He lifted her, and though she was fragile and bird-like, the effort strained every sinew and muscle in his aching back and shoulders. He held her to his chest and braced himself to take another step upwards. There was a faint shout far behind them, and he looked back over his shoulder. The outriders of the Arab pursuit column had reached the foot of the hill below them. One raised his jezel, and powder smoke spurted from the long barrel. Seconds later they heard the thud of the shot, but the range was still too long, and the ball came nowhere near them. Almost at the top, Tom sang out, trying to sound cheerful and gay. One more tilt at it, lads. He stepped out on the top of the hill, blinded by sweat. He knew he could go no further. He lowered Yasmini to the ground and wiped his eyes, but his vision was still blurred and starred with bright lights. He reeled on his feet, looked back at the others, and saw that they too were finished. Even Abberley had used up the last of his giant strength. He could hardly take the last few steps onto the crest. This is where we'll die, Tom thought. I still have the blue sword to make a decent fight of it, and in the end I will have the pistol for Yasmini and Dorian. He fumbled under his shirt and touched the butt. Then, suddenly, Uberly was beside him, shaking his arm, unable to speak, pointing down into the valley ahead. For a moment, Tom thought it must be a mirage, but then he realised that the dazzle that hurt his squinting eyes was the sunlight off the wide surface of the Lunga River, and that the little Centaurus was moored against the bank. They were so close that they could see tiny human figures on the open deck. Tom felt new strength flow into his legs. He drew the pistol from under his shirt and fired both barrels in the air. There was a sudden stir on the ship and Tom saw the flash of a telescope lens as it was aimed up at them. He waved wildly and the tall figure of Alf Wilson waved back. Tom turned and looked behind him. The Arab outriders were coming on at a gallop, already halfway up the hill. Without another word, Tom picked up Yasmini and launched himself down the slope towards the river. Gravity took hold of his legs, and he could hardly keep up with them. Each pounding step jarred his spine as the ground flew past under his feet. He heard Uberly and the others coming down after him, but he could not look back. It took all his wits and strength to stay on his feet. Yasmini closed her eyes in fear and clung to him with both arms around his neck. Suddenly there was a shout from behind them and a volley of musket fire. The Arabs had reached the top of the hill. A musket ball knocked a slab of bark and a burst of wet white splinters from the bowl of the tree close beside Tom. He could not keep up the pace, and with Yasmini's weight he could not stop. He felt one of his legs give way under him and he fell. He and the girl rolled in a tangle together until they slid into a boulder and lay stunned. Abberley came past them with Dorian on his back, bouncing and staggering, Batula and Luke Jarvis trying to keep up with him. Abberley's legs were beyond his control. He could not stop to help Tom, but Luke grabbed Tom's arm and dragged him up while Batula lifted Yasmini in his arms and took a few more unsteady paces down the hill. There was a rumble of hoofs as the Arabs charged their mounts down upon them. They had already couched their lances, and Tom could see the expressions of triumph on their dark faces. Then he heard Sarah shout his name, Tom, we're coming! He spun around and saw that she was astride a bay, dragging two spare horses on lead reins behind her, coming straight up the hill at full pelt. Alf Wilson was a length behind her, on a black mare from their herd. He also had two spares. Sarah reined in beside him, and Tom snatched Yasmini out of Batula's arms and almost threw her light body over the withers of Sarah's mount. Sarah grabbed her and prevented her from slipping over the other side of the horse. Go! Tom gasped. Get her out of here! Sarah said not a word, but tossed him the reins of the spare horses and wheeled away down the hill with Yasmini bumping like a wet sack before her. Tom left one horse for Luke and Batula and threw himself onto the back of the other. He caught up with Aberly swiftly and plucked Dorian's bleeding, battered body off his back. Take a bant from Alf, 
he shouted at Uberly as he swept past and tore down the hill after Sarah. He heard Arabic howls and driving hooves close behind him, and expected a lance thrust into his back at any instant. But he could not spare a backward glance. He was too busy clutching Dorian. In despair, he felt him slip from his grasp and could not hold him. Then suddenly, Uberly was riding beside him. He leaned across and pushed Dorian upright so that Tom could get a fresh grip around his shoulders. When they hit the level ground of the riverbank, Tom and Uberly were riding knee to knee, hard behind Sarah, who still held Yasmini. Next came Alf, Batula and Luke in a group. Close behind charged the Arab cavalry. They were gaining, reaching forward eagerly with the long lances. Sarah did not hesitate when she reached the river. She pushed her mount straight on. It leapt out from the high bank, then hit the water in a burst of spray and went clean under. Tom and Aberly followed her over the edge without checking their gallop. Then the others jumped almost on top of them. They came up, swimming beside their straining mounts, heading out into the stream towards where the Centaurus lay. Behind them, the Arabs reined up on the bank in a swirl, trying to draw their jezels out of their boots as their horses reared and plunged. The first blast of grape shot from one of the Centaurus's nine-pounders caught them, and half went down in a bloody, broken tangle of men and animals. The rest wheeled away in panic and tore back up the hill as another broadside from the Centaurus shattered the trees around them. The swimming horses reached the ship's side, and the seamen dragged the riders on board. As soon as he reached the deck... Tom ran straight to Sarah and the two embraced with water streaming from their hair and sodden clothing. In a fix, you are worth ten men to me, my beauty. Then he pulled back from her. Dorian is sore hurt. He will need all your care. Yasmini is done in also. Look to them while I get the ship away. He strode to the helm and glanced up at the rigging. Alf Wilson had everything shipshape and ready. If you please, Mr. Wilson... Will you get us underway down river? Tom ordered, then sought out Uberly. We're going to need the horses to drag the ship through the shallows. Take them down to the south bank on the far side of the river from the musselman. You should be able to keep pace with the ship. Uberly called to his sons Zama and Tula. Now I have a man's work for you. Come with me. They followed him over the ship's side to help round up the herd. Tom felt the ship come alive under his feet and swing out into the current. The banks started to stream past on either hand. He looked to the south bank and saw that Arbeli and his boys had the horses gathered into a compact herd and were bringing them along the bank at a canter. He swung round and looked to the north, just in time to see the vanguard of the main Arab army coming over the crest and start down towards the river in a solid stream of glittering armour, lances and musket barrels. Tom snatched the telescope from Alf Wilson's hand and focused it on the head of the advancing column. He picked out Abu Bakr's Turkish helmet and Al Sint's yellow turban riding beside him. I think we will have an honour guard all the way down river, he told Alf grimly. They won't be able to trouble us much until we reach the shallows. Before they reached the sea, they would have to negotiate the shallows, where the river spread out and slowed its plunge towards the ocean. Here, the sandbars were always changing depth and position. With the present height of the water, there would be barely enough to float the Centaurus through. He could expect Abu Bakr and Al Sind to follow them down and harass them all the way. Tom had only hours before they reached this treacherous stretch, and he set all hands to making the preparations for warping the ship over the bars and for defending her from enemy attack while she was most vulnerable. He seized a moment to visit the cabin where Sarah had taken Dorian and Yasmini. With relief, he found his brother resting easily in the little bunk. Sarah had changed the dressing on his wound, and she nodded at Tom to let him know all was well. Yasmini had recovered enough to help her, and she was feeding Dorian from a pewter bowl of soup. Tom spent only a minute with them before he hurried on deck again. The first thing he saw as he stepped over the combing was the long column of Omani cavalry streaming down the north bank after them. Five hundred or more, he estimated, and Alf Wilson agreed. 
Uh, enough to do us some mischief in a straight fight, Captain. We best not let it come to that. Tom smiled with more confidence than he felt. How long before we reach the shallows? Oh, two hours at this speed. Right then, we're going to lighten the ship. Throw everything overboard that is not essential to our voyage, he ordered. Then he lowered his voice so that it would not carry to Sarah in the cabin below. You can start with the harpsichord. With splash after high splash, they jettisoned the cargo. After the harpsichord, they sent over the bales of trade goods, left them bobbing in the wake as they bore down swiftly on the sandbars. Most of the powder kegs went over the side and all the iron round shot. Tom kept just enough powder and grape to fight during an hour of heavy engagement. Drain half the water from the barrels. Leave just enough to allow us to reach good hope on short rations, Tom cried. That would be a terrible hardship for the women and children. But capture by the Omani would be a lot worse, he consoled himself. While the crew worked, Tom kept an eye on the following cavalry. Where the current sped through the narrows, the Centaurus pulled ahead of the Omani column, but when it slowed up and the wind became fluky in the middle of the day, the sails flapped lazily and the Arabs regained all the ground they had lost. Tom loaded one of the stern cannon with a double charge of powder and a hat full of grape shot. When the head of the column came within extreme range, he fired at it. He did little damage, but the horses bucked and danced, and the Arabs fell back respectfully. Abeli and the two boys leading the horses on the south bank were keeping up well. Their herd was rested and strong, while the Arab mounts had been worn down by the long pursuit and could not match them. They came down a last chute of racing water, steering the wooden hull between outcrops of ugly black rock. Then all the speed and power went out of the current, and they idled down to where the sandbanks almost choked off the river with their yellow humps of gravel. Get the women and children into the longboats, Tom ordered. Every pound of weight will make a difference to our draft. Dorian was too weak to be sent ashore, and Yasmini stayed to take care of him. Sarah took the helm to free a man from the heavy work of warping. All the other passengers were taken across to the south bank and placed in Abeli's care. Then the longboat came back and stood by, ready to take the ship in tow if she went aground. Tom stood by the helm, and an anxious silence fell over the little centaurs as she ran down on the first meandering bend where they could see the shape of the bottom through the clear green water. The Arab cavalry column seemed to sense their opportunity and closed up eagerly. Tom cast a glance at them, but although they were now within easy shot, he was too busy to serve the little cannon, and he had to let them come on. The centaurs swept easily into the bend, and Tom let out his breath with relief. But it was premature. Suddenly she jarred and lurched under their feet as she touched the bottom, then shook herself free and slid on down the green river. Oh, close call, Tom breathed. And then to Sarah at the helm. Hold her fair in the green channel. The next turn came up and the ship was moving slowly on. The Arabs were half a musket shot back, cantering in formation down the flat, sandy north bank, lances glittering and headcloths blowing in the wind of their ride. The Centaurus hit the sand with her keel and slid to a halt so suddenly that they were almost thrown to the deck. Tom grabbed at the binnacle to steady himself. The Centaurus was grounded solidly. Boats away! Tom yelled, and every man aboard scrambled down into the longboats. Tom shouted to Sarah, Keep the helm centred! Then he left her to it and dropped down into the longboat. The coxswains in the stern of each longboat picked up the ends of the tow lines which were lying ready and made them fast. Then the rowers, hauling with all their strength, the two boats raced out ahead of the Centaurus until the lines came up hard. They strained at the long sweeps and tried to drag her off the clinging sand. From the south bank, Abeli charged his horse into the water and picked up the end of the long line Sarah tossed to him. He swam his horse back with it, and as his mount lunged out of the river onto the bank, he hitched the end of the line to the team of waiting horses. Yaya! Yaya! Haul away! He cracked his whip over their backs, and they took up the strain, then threw their full weight against the traces. 
The centaurus grated forward over the gravel, then stuck fast again. On the bank, the Arab horsemen broke into a gallop and swept forward, deploying as they came on. As they drew level with the stranded ship, the first rank wheeled and couched their lances. They struck the river in a wall of white spray and came straight at the men in the longboats. The water reached the bellies of the horses, then rose up to their shoulders. Now the leading horses were swimming, but their riders had the lances poised as they reached the leading longboat and swarmed around it like a pack of sharks around a dead whale. The seamen fired their pistols into the Arabs at close range, then stood up to beat them off with the long sweeps. But the boat was rocking wildly and must soon capsize under the sheer weight of the enemy. On the north bank, the next rank of cavalry wheeled into position for the charge, lining the edge of the sandbar in a solid mass. Abu Bakr was in the centre of the line, his cuirass and spiked helmet shining. He brandished his scimitar and led his horsemen forward at a trot that broke into a canter, then into a wild gallop. Sarah could not leave the wheel. Over the bows she saw the longboat surrounded by struggling masses of horses and men. Tom was standing in the stern with the blue sword in his hand, hacking at the heads of the Arabs in the water. Some of the Arabs were trying to cut the tow rope at the stern, sawing at it with their scimitars. Others were throwing their full weight and that of their steeds onto the gunwale. The boat was canting over until the water poured in over the side. It would soon swamp. Abu Bakr's squadron charged into the river, and even Sarah could see that it would soon be over. She was helpless to intervene. Until now she had not seen Dorian come up from the cabin. Yasmini's shoulder under his armpit to support him. Using her as a crutch, he hobbled painfully to the nearest cannon. He seized the marlin spike to traverse the stubby black barrel. Then he grabbed the smoking slow match out of the sand tub and pressed the end to the touch hole. The weapon crashed back on its tackle and a storm of grape shot hit the front rank of the charging Arab horsemen just as they reached the water's edge. Clinging to the wooden ship's rail, Yasmini stared across the channel. She saw a two-ounce ball of lead strike Abu Bakr full in the mouth. His teeth exploded out from between his lips in sparkling chips. Then the ball burst through his jawbone and out through the back of his skull. His spiked helmet was lifted from his head, and spun high in the air. The men around him were torn from the saddle, and the ranks buckled and turned back from the water's edge. Dorian stumbled to the next cannon and laid the aim. The horsemen saw the muzzle of the cannon turning towards them and spurred away in panic. The buzzing cloud of grape shot caught them in enfilade, and a dozen horses went down. In seconds the ranks were reduced to chaos. They had all seen General Abu Bakr's head shot away, and now Bashir al-Sint was down too, his horse killed under him. The fight went out of them. They broke and galloped away to avoid the next devastating blast of grape shot. Yasmini grabbed Dorian's arm as he tottered and almost fell, then led him to the next cannon. As it fired, the Centaurus heeled slightly to the recoil and slid reluctantly over the sand. The Arabs around the longboat saw their comrades on the bank riding away, leaving them unsupported. They turned their horses back towards the shore. Pull! Pull to burst your guts! Tom shouted at his crew, and they fell to the oars again. The Centaurus crept forward and touched again. Dorian fired another cannon shot, and as the ship rocked, Abeli lashed the horse team in the traces. Slowly and reluctantly, the Centaurus slid over the bank and floated free in the deep channel beyond. Back on board, Tom roared triumphantly. Get the women and children back on board. Abberley piled his wives and all their offspring into the longboat as its keel touched the beach. Then he cut the traces of the horses and slapped their rumps to send them galloping into the forest. He ran back and jumped over the gunwale of the boat as the rowers pulled after the Centaurus. The ship was floating away swiftly downstream, and they had to pull hard to catch her. It is a clear run down to the mouth from here, Abberley told Tom, as he came to where he stood beside the helm. They both looked back at the shattered Arab force on the north bank. 
They were making no effort to regroup and continue the pursuit. Stand the men down, Mr. Wilson, said Tom, and give them all a double tot of rum for their trouble. Alf Wilson touched his cap. Begging your pardon, Captain, but you threw the rum barrel overboard. Do you want to put the ship about and go back to fetch it? His tone was serious, but his lips twitched. I think the men will have to wait for it until we reach Good Hope, Tom replied as solemnly. Tom stood at the stern rail as the Centaurus made her offing and the dark mass of the African mainland slowly merged with the gathering night far behind. There was a light step on the deck beside him and he reached out to pull Sarah in front of him so that her back was pressed against his chest. He hugged her hard to him and reached over her shoulder to kiss her ear. She shuddered deliciously as his beard tickled the back of her neck. Dory is asking for you, she said. I will go to him presently, he answered, but made no move to leave her. After a long silence, she asked, What happens now, Tom? I know not, lass. Good hope first, and after that, let come what will. Well, one thing only is certain. I shall have a little surprise for you once we reach good hope. Ah, he sounded interested. What is it? If I tell you, it will be no surprise. She reached behind her, took both his hands and placed them firmly on her stomach. It took him a moment to understand. Then he let out a roar of delighted laughter. Jesus love you, Sarah Courtney, I know not what to say. She knew that that was his most extravagant expression of joy. Then hold your peace, you great booby, and give me a kiss instead. That is the end of Monsoon by Wilbur Smith, 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 by Wilbur Smith by Wilbur Smith.